Welcome to this webinar on the value of accreditation. This webinar is hosted by Swedish accreditation bodies, uh, SWEDAC. My name is Peter Kronvall and I am the communication manager at SWEDAC. As mentioned, this afternoon is all about the value of accreditation, today and in the future. We have a program with interesting and different perspectives. My name is Anna Werner. I work for Swedak's communication agency. I collaborate on a daily basis with Peter Kronvall and together we will guide you through this afternoon. Swedak's main objective this afternoon is to share different views in order to build insight. We all can go home, discuss and further uh, evolve. Most of our speakers have a European perspective, but we think and hope that the program will be relevant for a broader audience. We have participants logged into this webinar from all parts of the world, South America, North America, Asia and Europe. You represent accreditation bodies, accredited bodies, standardization bodies, regulators, researchers and industry. A warm welcome to all of you. We want you to feel involved. Therefore, we have set up a Mentipol. Scroll down to the fact box and you will find it there. Which questions do you find important for the future of accreditation? Your vote will have an impact on our closing debate later this afternoon. You will also find the possibility to ask questions to the speakers. We will take care of the questions the best we can. We will read them all. However, our program is very tight and we can therefore not guarantee all questions will be brought into this webinar. Last year, SWEDAC celebrated 30 years. Ulf Hammarström is the fourth director general of SWEDAC and has been in the organization for two years now. With his background from different positions in the Swedish state administration, and eight, nine years in the European Union in Brussels, he's ready to lead Swedak into the future. Welcome, Ulf. Thank you very much, Peter. A warm welcome also from me, and I'm very happy that so many of you have decided to spend the afternoon together with us, uh, talking about those issues so uh, important to our professional future. Accreditation is all about trust, as you all know. Uh, and trust is a very fundamental part of a stable society. I believe that uh, for, a for a society to be stable, we all need to feel trust in our everyday lives, and that will affect how much we will be willing to contribute and to participate in society. So it's a very critical function. And to me, accreditation is symbolized by a glass of water. Uh, if we go up in the morning, and we pour a glass of water from the tap, and we do not check the uh, color of it, we do not smell it, but we just drink it, then a critical level of uh, trust exists in society. And we all know that accreditation is a very cr important and critical part of that. We believe that also in the future, uh, accreditation will have a critical role in underpinning society's trust. But like everything else, we will need to uh, develop in tune with the society. In Swedak, we are trying to spend more time on uh, looking outwards and looking towards the future than we have uh, done before. We believe that we are good at what we are doing today. But what will be required for us to be equally good in the future, in five years and in ten years? How do we ensure that we are still relevant as a primary uh, quality assurance tool in our society. Firstly, we are convinced that we need to su support society in uh, defining and understanding accreditation, not least the legislators and the, um, the uh, defining parts of society. Help them in understanding and measuring what is the value of accreditation, and where may, indeed, other quality assurance measures be better than accreditation. In this, we think we need a forward-looking dialogue with society on different levels, with society in general on the very definition of quality in society. That is not once and for all uh, defined, we all remember that sustainability was not a self-evident part of quality 
not so long ago. And obviously there will come new elements also in uh, how we define quality. We feel that we also need more of a dialogue with customers and stakeholders. How do they measure the value of what we do? And what are their prerequisites for achieving that value now and in the future? Also, we need to study technological developments. I need only mention artificial intelligence for you to understand the complexity and the possibilities of those issues. How can artificial intelligence, as one example, be used in the future to uh, help assuring quality? But also, what are all the uh, involved questions legally, ethically, and so on? In short, we believe we are facing strategic challenges. This is also why uh, the European Corporation on Accreditation, EA, is changing its structure to make us better prepared to deal with strategic issues and strategic challenges by changing our structure and also implementing our new strategy from good to great uh, 2025. We cannot meet today without mentioning that we are in the middle of a raging global pandemic. Pandemic. So many lives are tragically lost and so much economic destruction. But the pandemic is also speeding up and accelerating developments which would have come anyway, but they come at a much quicker pace than they would have done. The future is indeed coming faster. Digitalization, ways of working, uh, climate change factors, factors which uh, affect climate change are coming much quicker now and they will be with us also after the pandemic. And of course, the pandemic shows the vital, and I really mean vital, meaning of quality assurance when you think of the protective equipment that is needed in hospitals treating COVID-19 patients. Swedak has decided that we must come out stronger and better from the pandemic. We do not hold our breath and wait for the world to go back to January 2020. But we will be different and better coming out of the pandemic. And I think in particular of three areas which I will mention. The first one is that we have uh, started more exchange and collaboration with other national accreditation bodies. I think this is great. It's a good coming out of it and something we will want to maintain also after the pandemic. Secondly, we have been able to change into other ways of working more digitally, more remote than we previously would have thought possible to do at this uh, pace. And these lessons learned, they are good for economy and for um, being more climate smart than we were in our previous ways of working. So we need to maintain them as well, also after the pandemic. And thirdly, we are a more flexible employer. We have uh, realized that it is very functional also to spend more time working from home than we thought before, making it easier to combine private life with working life, making us a more attractive employer and of course making it easier to um, recruit and maintaining the best competence. We know that you all have your um, experiences and viewpoints on all these issues. There are no uh, silver bullets, no easy solutions to uh, the difficult and complex issues facing us. So with this seminar, we do not hope to find, find that, but uh, we want to inspire to a continued discussion and maybe also finding new networks to, uh, to uh, exchange in. So again, a very warm welcome to all of you and thank you very much for participating and uh, I look forward to the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Ulf. As mentioned, this webinar will be a lot about the future, 
but we will start in the other end with history. Kristina Tam Hallström and Martin Gustafsson are researchers at SCORE, Stockholm School of Economics and Stockholm University. Their research is about the history of quality assurance. And they are here today to help us understand what led up to today's system. And with that, maybe say something about the future. Over to Stockholm. So, uh, my name is Christina Tam Hallström. Uh, I'm associate professor in management at the Stockholm School of Economics and also research director at the Stockholm Center for Organizational Research. And I'm Martin Gustafsson, associate professor in economic history and a researcher at the same center, SCORE. Uh, we are happy to get this opportunity uh, to present findings from a research project that we are currently working on. But first, a few words about uh, SCORE, our research environment. Stockholm Center for Organizational Research is a multidisciplinary uh, cent research center for basic research in social science with a specific interest in the organization and governance of the public sector and its intersection with the market and civil society. Many projects at SCORE address questions about legitimacy, authority, power and change. The research we will talk about today is situated uh, among the SCORE studies working on the theme organizing markets. As organization scholars, uh, we see many markets as highly organized and more or less embedded in social structures upheld by rules, monitoring and sanctions in which state organizations, but also other market organizers are engaged and play important roles in shaping markets. To us, business associations, consultancy firms, ranking institute, professions, standard setters, certifiers and accreditation bodies are all examples of market organizers. In this presentation, we broader uh, our time horizon. We will talk about the contemporary regulatory regime that you are all part of, but also compare it to uh, regimes of previous time periods in which standards have played uh, a central role. Our purpose is to place the present in perspective. Knowledge about the history of previous social orders, as well as knowledge about the processes leading up to new orders, when old structures are questioned and new ones are proposed and negotiated, help us to unpack the taken for granted of today and to be reminded of alternative ways of ordering, and hopefully also to inspire us to think about possible avenues for the future. So, um, oops, I will try to, there. We have organized this presentation according to a few points. <laughs> Our presentation. Yeah, first we make a short overview of social science research about the history of standardization. Uh, we conclude by highlighting shortcomings and research gaps that we believe are important to address uh, scholarly. We briefly present our research design for the Swedish case of standards-based regulation of markets from 1880 18, 18, until, until today. And after that, we present our findings about three regulatory regimes uh, in Sweden since the end of the 19th century but with a main focus on the period from 1930 until today. We end our presentation by some concluding remarks and reflections about the future. So <clears throat> the research field that we belong to and wish to contribute to, um, there are a few studies uh, about national standard setters established at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, but the majority of the studies are really about the large number of standard setters with international reach established in the second half of the 20th century, having proliferated into new areas, including various aspects of management system standards. Several studies an analyze standard setters' legitimacy and struggle for authority. 
only a few scholars uh, have taken an interest in consumers as actors in standard setting, highlighting that they are both strong and weak. On the one hand, consumer interests uh, have successfully been placed on the standard setting agenda. But on the other, consumers often have scarce resources, resources and a hard time of making themselves heard among large corporations, for example. The research about certification uh, is exten extensive with questions about why certification has emerged, problem problematizations about auditor independence, unintended consequences of management system certification, as well as legitimacy problems arising in some certification mar markets due to a race to the bottom. Accreditation that started to grow and expand in the 1990s can be seen as a response to such legitimacy problems in certification markets. Still, the research interest in accreditation has been weak until just recently. In our research group, we have scholars trying to explain why escalating control structures with accreditation and peer reviews emerge in some empirical contexts, but not in others. In other ongoing studies, we analyze how accreditation is organized and coordinated globally in a network involving thousands of organizations, specifically highlighting the role and challenges of member organizations such as the EA and IIF. Finally, a few scholars in our research field uh, have investigated development within the EU specifically. With the launch of the new approach and the global approach, in this research, uh, it is highlighted the neoliberal ideology behind these frameworks with its strong belief in market solutions and principles of self-control combined with accredited certification and discusses how these regulatory frameworks are driven by goals uh, of realizing the internal market and um, facilitating world trade. So a few conclusions uh, may be made uh, based on this overview. Overall, we see an overemphasis on the current regime and its emergence since the mid-1980s. Uh, with the exception of studies of national standard setters, the scholarly attention placed on previous regimes is, is scarce. More specifically, we lack studies of regulatory instruments in addition to standards uh, that existed in the regime before the current one, such as monitoring activities before the management systems certification and accreditation. Uh, and other monitoring practices have existed uh, in which the state often played major roles, but these have not been investigated, nor the processes uh, of the dismantling of such practices taking place as the new regime has been developed. We also lack studies about sanctions linked uh, to the use of standard in markets, that is, what happens when producers do not comply with commonly agreed rules. Finally, we find an overall lack of consumer perspective uh, on the use of standards and related uh, instruments in regulating markets. So try to address these shortcomings, we have designed a study posing two research questions. How and by whom are regulatory regimes organized? And how does this organization impact on the relationship between important mar market actors such as the state, corporations and civil society repre representing consumers? Um, and we have, um, we have used, we departure from three different regulatory regimes uh, that the research of historical standardization has identified and restrict our in investigation to Sweden. Uh, which perhaps could be seen as an extreme case. Uh, but we also know from historical research that the state involvement was highly present also in other countries, in particular during the middle period. And the three periods we focus on is from 1880 to 1929, uh, 1930 to 1979, and the current 1980 to 2020. Um, and we place a specific focus on the middle period, as I earlier said. For each regime, we look at three fundamental building blocks of a regulatory regime. Rules, in this case standards, monitoring and sanctions. For the first and third period, 
uh, we mainly use previous research and for the middle period we have collected new empirical material that we will present now. Yes, so here's a picture of the three mentioned regulatory regimes or the three waves of the standardization movements as they have been called in standardization research. As been said, we have had a special interest in the middle period and the shift towards the last one. The work of the standard setters in the first period was first and foremost about to coordinate industrial production and, and facilitate trade. During the second wave, standards and monitoring also for consumer protection grew stronger. The last period is more centered around the project of creating trust in markets and, as before, facilitating world trade. Thus, coordinate, protection and trust are three keywords that characterize these three periods. We also think it's interesting to clarify the political regime corresponding to each period as a contextual dimension to the solution chosen for market regulation that the state will have different roles in the organization of the market during different time periods is indicated already by these overaching political shifts from a social liberal or a social democratic to a neoliberal era. To characterize the social democratic period in the mid 20th century in the light of the period before and in the one that we are living in today in a more concrete way, we now add the universe of monitoring organizations that we have found in our research. In the figure, we have mapped the year when these monitors were established. You can hardly see the names or, and, and, or the acronyms of these organizations, but our point here is only to demonstrate general patterns concerning the involvement of, first, the amount of organizations, and second, the type of organizations established. Civil society organizations are green, corporations are blue, and the state organizations are red. In the first period, there are only a few new established organizations, a mix of civil society organizations and state ones. For instance, a few so-called classification societies could be seen, the green ones to the left, among them Biro Veritas. In the next period, we see a heavy increase in monitoring organizations. Many of them are state-run testing laboratories in red color, but also civil society organizations with test labs of their own and a base in the consumer movement, the green ones. And in the last period, we almost see an explosion of new established organizations. The majority of them are for profit, the blue ones. State monitoring organizations are still there, the red ones, but few new ones are established and their role is also changing. In this picture, we illustrate the general tendency within each period regarding the object of control. While there was greater focus on testing physical products in the two earlier periods, the focus since the 1990s is increasingly on monitoring organizations and their management systems. And finally, in this picture, we highlight sanctions in different time periods. During the first wave, the sanctions are restricted and more a question of business to business relationships. The consumer interest gained great importance during the second wave, as well as the perception that highlighted the imbalance and possible conflict between, on the one hand, informed and powerful corporations, and on the other hand, less informed and less resourceful consumers. Here the state came in, came in as a guardian to protect consumers from bad products and producers through clear sanctions. For example, the possibility to publish lab test results of products in state-owned consumer magazine, Rodeurin. One high civil servant active in the 1970s and the 1980s told us in one interview, quote, the companies followed our recommendations because we had this weapon in our hand, the publication weapon, that is the threat of nationwide displaying test results to consumers, end of quote. This is a quite different type of sanction compared to the ones used today. 
where the potential conflict between consumers and producers is also downplayed. The audit reports notifying deviations are not for public as the Rode Rhone was. And the worst case scenario in case of non-successful certification is not bankruptcy due to nationwide negative criticism, but the withdrawal of the certificate. And these actions will the consumers be more or less excluded from, or at least not aware of, if not exposed in national media. Okay, so we will try to wrap this up. Uh, we will draw a few conclusions, mainly about the differences um, between the previous and the current regimes. First, we identify a rhetorical shift um, in how the regimes are framed. In previous uh, regime, consumer protection is key, uh, a key objective, and quality control is a common concept used. In the new regime, the overarching objective uh, is to create trust in markets, both for corporations and consumers. Uh, the concept of control is dropped and replaced by quality assurance, which has a somewhat more positive connotation. Second, as we summarize uh, through the table, uh, we see changes in the use of standards, monitoring and sanctions. After the launch of the ISO 9000 standard in 1987, more and more standards take the system approach compar compared to before, that is, a focus on producer rather than the final product. In turn, this means that more values can be included in the regulation of markets and producers, such as environmental management, fair work conditions, diversity, etc. But the management system approach also means an abstraction and increased distance to the final product. Uh, one consequence is that a new type of monitoring is needed uh, with a focus on management systems rather than the physical products. In Sweden, this leads to the majority of the state-driven testing laboratories being closed down in the 1990s, whereas the market for both for-profit for certification and for-profit laboratories expand substantially, as does the practice of state accreditation. Following this change, we also see that the character of sanction has changed, as Martin said. If producers do not, do not live up to standards, they may be reported on deviations in a certification audit report. And in case of really severe deviations, they may lose the certificate and thereby access to important markets where certification is required. However, information about deviations and lost certificates is only accessible to the two parties involved in the audit process or purchase of laboratory service and not to consumers. So from a consumer perspective and compared to previous regime where consumers could access information, such information, the new regime is less, a less public one. One conclusion based on this is that we see an increased distance between the state and both producers and consumers. Producers are expected to perform self-control and are responsible to document their management system in line with an ISO standard. Certifiers act as in, an intermediary, performing audits of producers' management systems and are responsible for monitoring that they are in compliance with the standard. Accreditors that within the EU represent, are representing the state perform evaluations of certifiers' management systems and are responsible for monitoring that they are in compliance with the standard. And a member organization such as EAA performs peer reviews of accreditors uh, and is responsible for monitoring that they are in compliance with the standard. There are lots of standards and lots of monitoring going on and consumers are key actors in legitimizing the regime. All the facilitation of world trade is, uh, is emphasized uh, in the purpose of much regulatory activities. It is often highlighted that the ultimate that it is ultimately for the consumers to be able to trust products in markets that the regime exists. But their access to and knowledge about its functioning is restricted. Consumers in today's regime have access to and possibility to influence standards, the development of standards, but not to the processes of certification and accreditation. So, um, in a global world, there is an obvious advantage with today's regime. Um, 
It is rational, professional and des designed to function across borders uh, with a focus on eliminating technical barriers to trade. However, as a starting point for a discussion about uh, the future of accreditation, we have a few reflections. Uh, about challenges we see through our comparative and ongoing research. If producers perceive uh, the regime too abstract and complex the question is, uh, and question its value, there is a potential problem concerning legitimacy. We know from our studies uh, made of IAF and some of its members uh, that one threat that is discussed at these meetings is that corporations will stop using ISO 9001, which thereby uh, would influence the work of both certifiers and accreditors, at least in the areas where certification is voluntary. voluntary. The same goes for consumers. Uh, we know from um, that consumers, on the one hand, often don't know so many details about uh, the current regime. On the other hand, some informed consumers uh, consumers that have submitted formal complaints to Svedak, for example, do find it, it is highly complex and abstract and it's difficult to understand and evaluate, evaluate it, the regime. Despite thousands of organizations involved, uh, many standards and monitoring practices, there are examples of bad business practices that are approved by the regime and still continue to exist and the distribution of responsibility among the involved organizations is not easy to grasp. Such aspects could make consumers question the value of the regime and thereby its legitimacy. So one question that we would like to raise um, regarding possible challenges in the future uh, is how to handle legitimacy problems that could arise uh, if, um, if a regime becomes too abstract and remote from its beneficiaries. So thank you, that was our presentation. Thank you. Uh, and a lot to discuss uh, further there. Uh, we will just start with uh, the question um, you described, uh, three big waves in which uh, quality assurance has evolved. Would you say we are approaching or are we in the fourth wave yet? <laughs> I, I think that it's a hard for us to... It's a good question but hard to answer. Uh, I, I don't really know if it's the end of the phase or the beginning. Ah, I see. Um, if we then back up a little bit, and uh, you, you raised a number of questions there, uh, which I think is very interesting. I will just focus now on, on the consumer perspective. You say that the consumer in today's system is a bit neglected. Uh, what would you say, what would be the, the benefit for on a society level if the consumer right or the consumer perspective was a bit lifted moving forward? We, we don't say that the, the consumer is completely neglected, but uh, the consumer has been, it's an echo <laughs> going on in the noise here. Um, we mean, we, we just want to point out that the consumer had more access to uh, parts of this regime before when it was more at the national level and more uh, governed by the state or controlled by the state. Uh, and today, uh, consumers, it is a very abstract system and it's difficult to evaluate uh, the functioning of the system. And we can see it in when, we, when we go through the archives of complaints, uh, the very few complaints that come regarding uh, the few consumers that know about this system, that question, uh, that question how, it, uh, how you can evaluate and, and uh, really believe in it. So we, we just <laughs> we don't want to say that they're neglected. It's really consumers are uh, emphasized as uh, key uh, actors in the system, but uh, on a very abstract level. Um, so that is our point. Mm, I see. And you had the you had several conclusions there where the consumer perspective was one and legislate. Um, 
sorry, I lost the word there, but uh, to be, uh, could you help me? Legislation. No? Uh, leg yeah, your other, uh, the other factor you mentioned as very important. Uh, I'm thinking about that perspective. How will you move on there? I didn't really get the question there. Uh, also legal, um, Le legitimacy. Le legit legitimacy question. You, you raised uh, this, this as an issue. I'm interested in how will, what is your next step in, in that field? What, what, are, what we will do research about. Yes, exactly. Um, um, no, but we, we, we will continue to deepen this. Uh, this is an ongoing study, so we will, uh, we will uh, enrich this picture that we have presented today, uh, which is work in progress. Uh, and we, yeah, we, we think it's, <laughs> it's an extremely important role we have as researchers to look at. It's not, uh, I mean, it's always important to look how the world is organized and how markets are, uh, are regulated. Uh, so we will, um, I don't know how, how we can say how we will change our orientation, we will, we will continue with this. And we have also, um, we have several books that we have uh, written about this, uh, our research that uh, can be, that you can access. Um, th these are just a few examples and we can, uh, uh, I mean, it's difficult to give, <laughs> to give a precise answer here to you, but uh, we can keep in be in touch and keep in dialogue with you regarding these important questions. Yes, of course. Thanks. Mm. Uh, one last question. If you worked at a national accreditation body, what would you like to evolve further or reflect on further if you were to give advice? Question, please. <laughs> I'm not working for an accreditation board, but I think the questions we raised uh, at the end about uh, if the regime becomes too abstract and remote from its beneficiaries, it's important to think about that and uh, to take inspiration from previous times. So we, we can see how it, ha it could look different. And I, I can't provide uh, exact uh, answers on this, but uh, I think it's an important question that we raise at the end of our presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. Matt Gantley is the chief executive of the National Accreditation Board in United Kingdom, UCAS. Mm. Matt Gantley joined UCAS in 2018. He came from NQA, a certification body accredited by UCAS. When joining UCAS, Gantley pointed out three challenging areas. The Brexit, the pace of technology development and peer-to-peer -peer reviews. He's here today to talk about where accreditation stands in the United Kingdom and what value it gives to society. Over to Manchester. Peter, could I just test so you can hear me clearly from Manchester? Oh, yeah. Loud Manchester. and clear. Loud and clear. Okay, excellent. Uh, and apologies, first of all, uh, uh, my uh, screens aren't working quite rightly, but if you don't mind, I'm going to share with you my PowerPoint slides um, on a separate screen. So Peter, can I just check again that you can see that clearly? Now we no, nothing yet. Nothing yet, okay. That might just be buffering yeah, now we, now we can see it. All right, okay, that's yep. excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. May I firstly say thank you to Ulf, Peter and Anna and all our friends in SWEDAC for inviting UCAS to this important conference on the value of accreditation and for giving me the opportunity to speak about this topic. A topic that we believe adds real tangible benefit for our national, uh, European and global economies and has a valuable role to play for government, public and enterprise. As Peter has already mentioned, my name is Matt Gantley. I'm the Chief Executive of the United Kingdom Accreditation Service, which is a government appointed national accreditation body for the United Kingdom. And I would like to speak to you for about 15 minutes, firstly, to clarify what accreditation is, why it matters. And I would like to explain who we are, where we fit in and what we do to support the UK quality infrastructure. 
And finally, what are the challenges and the opportunities ahead? Alongside to give some examples of accreditation as we go along. So as we go through, you'll note my presentation is full of information sources, graphs and pictures, and I would be happy for these slides to be made, able, made available to delegates afterwards so that you can look at these in further detail. This will allow me to move through materials at greater pace. Of course, at the end of the presentation, uh, we, we have the opportunity for questions and answers. Moreover, I'll be here throughout the whole conference, so I'd, I would be happy to address any points in the discussion forums or the team chat facility. So why does accreditation matter? As these pictures show from a video produced by IEF and ILAC, at work, home and play, accreditation matters because alongside standards, it is the hidden infrastructure that ensures that we can be confident in our daily lives from the moment that we wake up in our bed where the materials are tested for fire safety to our breakfast and the quality of the water on our, in our kettle or the food safety of the butter on our toast from the emissions of our cars and our drive to, to work and the calibration of speed cameras to the integrity of construction products in our workplace. These are just some of the very small but many thousands of ways that standards and accreditation protect the way we live our lives. In these thousands of ways, we can be confident in our workplace, at home and in play that the products and the services that we use are safe, legal, secure, sustainable and quality because of standards and accreditation. So where do we see these signs of assurance? Well, we see them in several ways, including a range of certification marks. For example, the BSI Kite Mark or the CE Mark for designated products that are sold in the European Union, which attests to the appropriate health and safety and environmental standards. We see it in the Chinese Product Conformity Mark and the new UK Conformity Assessment Mark, which will come into place on the 1st of January 2021. Behind these and many other symbols, marks and labels, we find the hidden assurance of accreditation. UCAS and its accreditation symbols on the left hand side, as well as those of SWEDAC and other ILAC and IF accreditation bodies, are the final stamp of approval that testing, inspection and certification and verification is done so competently, consistently and impartially. So what is accreditation? Well, accreditation can be technically defined as a procedure by which an authoritative body gives formal recognition that a body or person is competent to carry out specific tasks. As we can see from the slide, accreditation is a formal independent recognition of the competence of a conformity assessment body to perform specific assessment tasks. These can range very broadly uh, across a, uh, many, many facets, but they drop into four main, major categories. Testing, for example, COVID-19 testing. Inspection certification, for example, personal protective equipment product testing and also increasingly the validation of data and the verification of claims. These conformity assessment bodies are evaluated against a series of international standards, as we can see from the, the shaded box on the right, which provide a consistent global framework to allow testing, inspection and certification to be recognised across the globe and especially across trade borders, as Stefan will, will, uh, will go into more detail in his presentation. So, for example, certification across the international standard ISO 17021 is, is one of the largest accreditation schemes, <coughs> excuse me, for example, with over 1.1 million businesses across the world certified to ISO 9001. A key point to remember from this slide is that these harmonized accreditation standards are developed at a global level, bringing consistency across the world on the way that conformity assessment is applied in practice. Another way to understand accreditation is to think of it as the final level of control before government. UCAS is the appointed body by the Department for Business and Industrial Strategy to deliver this essential public authority and public service role. Throughout a hierarchy of accredited conformity assessment, international and national standards un underpin the evaluation process. As a minimum, we evaluate the competence and conformity assessment bodies on an annual basis to ensure that they are competent and delivering an impartial service for the prime purpose, again, to ensure government, consumers and enterprises and purchasers can be confident and assured and ultimately have trust in the quality, legality and safety of the products and the services 
that you, they use. Accreditation, though, does not act alone or exist alone. Instead, it is part of a broader network often referred to as the U United Kingdom of Quality Infrastructure. Now, this model is mirrored in Swe Sweden and is modeled uh, and mirrored all around the world in most of the, the advanced economies or emerging economies around the world. Bringing together accreditation from UCAS and other accreditation bodies based upon harmonized consensus based standards in the UK from the British Standards Institute with scientific and industrial metrology from the National Physical Laboratory and legal metrology from the National Measurement Office and finally with trading standards for market surveillance. Each of these elements complements each other to ensure safety, quality and legality of products in, in those that we use on a daily basis. Equally, accreditation does not have value alone. It is intrinsically connected to and part of a broader assurance, testing, inspection and certification marketplace. This is a strong marketplace estimated to have a total value of around 200 billion euros with a growth rate of 5% per annum and a potential to grow actually with in a, for an estimated 60% more because of the potential to outsource uh, to accredited conformity assessment. Because of this valuable role to the UK and the global economy, bodies such as OECD, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank Group, work closely with accreditation and, and other standards bodies, and they have developed uh, mutual rec recognition and aim to facilitate that through trade and development. They've also published a number of independently verified reports attesting to the value and the economic benefits of standards for example, in the United Kingdom, a, a research study found that uh, uh, almost 38% of UK productivity growth could be attributed to standards and accreditation. UK exports at a value of over 6 billion of additional exports per year could be attributed again to standards and accreditation. But let's take a step back and look to the real world and remember that beyond the economic benefits of accreditation and the value, the economic value of accreditation, accreditation of standards are essential to ensuring health and safety. And when this process is sidestepped, as we saw, we saw, for example, in the UK recently, where personal protective equipment that didn't meet appropriate standards or had been counterfeited came into the UK with significant cost and significant disruption. And so it's essential the government and public all, all understand the value of accredited conformity assessment to ensure that, that especially for personal protective equipment and other COVID-19 critical areas are properly upheld. So Stefan is going to cover this in more detail. Stefan from uh, the CEO of DAX is going to cover international mutual recognition in a lot more detail. But as this slide indicates, UCAS is a regional member of the European body for accreditation, IEF for certification, and ILAC for inspection and testing. What is important to remember from this slide is that there are over 102 accreditation bodies globally with mutual recognition, recognition agreements covering all of the major areas of conformity assessment. What's also important to note is the number of laboratories, inspection bodies, and certification bodies is more than sufficient to cover the needs of trade and the evaluation of products and services across a very broad range of activities. There's currently 60,000 laboratories and over 8,000 certification bodies globally. As I mentioned, UCAS is appointed by, as a public authority by the government, and we work closely with government to, uh, to ensure that there is a, a balance between regulation and market-driven solutions. This allows us to be an important tool for government and the free market. We can provide a balance and a bridge between government-driven solutions and market-driven solutions, allowing greater flexibility and a more cost-effective solution than industry regulation. This can be particularly useful for new emerging markets, products and services. For example, those created for the fourth industrial revolution, such as the Internet of Things and blockchain technology. This slide just shows so many of the examples and the way in which uh, the UCAS has worked with government to provide a flexible solution for evaluating competence and compliance. For example, in the forensic sector, we work with a forensic science regulator from food standards for certification and testing of, of food safety to the work that we're doing with the Ministry of Housing on addressing public safety in high-rise buildings to the close collaboration we've had with 
our national health service for COVID-19 testing. But before I finish, I wanted to reflect on some key factors that are driving the way that our marketplace is evolving. In the broader marketplace, the new work arrangements brought about through COVID-19 and the new normal will fundamentally affect business and society. Political change and uncertainty, for example, through Brexit, has created uh, an uncertainty and, and, and trade disturbances, which and other areas where it's in the USA or in China will affect the way conformity assessment works in the future. Moreover, declining public trust in, in large organizations or in government bodies is affecting the, the uh, assumption behind and the trust within conformity assessment. Escalating environmental concerns, equality and inclusion, and inclusion, the fourth industrial revolution, all of these should affect the way we think about accreditation and conformity assessment body as part of our strategy. But we must remember we are part of this strong assurance testing and inspection and certification market, and we need to work very closely with the accredited conformity assessment bodies to adapt to these challenges and opportunities. For example, the challenges and the opportunities that remote assessments bring to us in the future, as well as the opportunities to develop new models for evaluating compliance through risk-based approaches. As a final note for reflection, I wanted to reflect on some of the ingredients for success, which, which plays very much into the understanding of the value of accreditation. Firstly, on the right, left hand side, you can see our experience tells us that there must be a number of really important internal factors which will depend, which will affect the value of accreditation from the degree to which we have industry insight and understanding, the competence across our business processes, not just the technical delivery of assessment processes, but our scheduling activities, our marketing, our sales, our training activities. We need agile and customer focused processes, and most importantly, a culture that is collaborative, constructive, and consistent. Now, Ulf asked me a question before the seminar, which is when is accreditation appropriate and when is it not suitable? And our experiences in this diagram simply shows on the, the right hand side of, of this slide is that accreditation is most valuable and most appropriate when these external ingredients of success are in place. A clear specification and engaged scheme owners, clear standards, clear requirements. Engaged specifiers, for example, industry bodies or government bodies with commercial market drivers for a reason for organizations to go forward with the test inspection or certification and for certification bodies or inspection bodies to come into that marketplace. There need to be competent conformity assessment bodies and of course accreditation bodies that all work collaborative, collaboratively together as part of an international mutual recognition framework. So we believe all of those ingredients come together to make sure that accreditation is effective uh, for the marketplace. So in last slide, I'd like to say thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, I know I've gone through quite a lot of information there, but I do hope we'll have the opportunity to, to, to speak with you and answer any of your questions as we go through. I truly believe that UCAS as this national accreditation body has a very significant role to play for government and the public and, uh, and industry. And we can see from many case studies, there is a real uh, background to evidence to prove the value of accreditation. But going forward, we have new opportunities and challenges that we need to build into our strategy as we go along. So with that, I'll pass back to Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. You're very interesting, interesting presentation. presentation. Going back to your second last slide there, you know, spoke about the value. Do you have any thoughts on how you further can increase the value of accreditation for society? Yeah, very much. I think um, this is what's key to, if I go back to actually showing that slide of what makes that success of um, accreditation, if I just come back here again, is, the, is, is those four major ingredients of, of success. And that is the accreditation bodies work closely with the, the standards body to or the, the organization that is creating the requirements. So they cl we clearly understand what they're trying to achieve and choose the most appropriate model of conformity assessment, whether that's inspection, testing or certification. Also, we work very closely with specifiers, in particular government or industry bodies, so that they understand how they make different 
in uh, the understanding of that requirement and the understanding of the competence and the impartiality of the way that uh, that conformity assessment scheme works. We also have to work closely with our conformity assessment bodies to bring them up to the highest uh, possible standards. And, and lastly, as an accreditation body, we need to work across uh, our, our accreditation community to make sure there is consistency in the way that we work. All of those ingredients come together, as well as for us, we need to continue to promote the value of accreditation to industry groups, to government. We need to ensure that we have case studies and evidence to prove that how accreditation works. And we need to um, get out more and do more events, webinars, programs. Um, and actually, I'd like to pay uh, some praise to the work that ILAC and IAF have done, particularly in producing case studies uh, on the value of accreditation to government and public bodies as well as uh, to industry and it's uh, actually in my last slide i've given some links to the the guidance and the uh, the best practice that is put, put forward by ILAC and IF. okay thank you Matt. Uh, how do you see on the challenge for accreditation to keep up with the market demands for example regarding uh, effective accreditation processes and uh, time to establish new schemes for the market yeah, I think because of its very nature, um, the development of a, of a, especially new schemes, is it does take time. Uh, you know, even at its very fastest, to develop an accreditation scheme would would take at least six months. But on practice, they can be uh, a year and a half to two years to develop. That's because all of those key elements must come together: the standards development or the requirements, the the uh, conformity assessment bodies, making sure that they're competent, making sure that there's a scheme owner or a driver pushing it forward. So uh, we need agility. We need to make sure that we're engaged and working with all of those different parties. We need to make sure that when we understand the requirements, we build the procedures and we engage properly with all the different uh, areas. But um, it, accreditation is not always the most suitable solution, especially for schemes that are very dynamic or evolving very, very quickly. Schemes that, for example, are um, very niche uh, or there's only one uh, a, a certification body or where there isn't a very strong uh, uh, market driver for, that, for that, that scheme to be developed. So we have to uh, understand where we, we uh, play the most important role, where we have the greatest value and focus on those and making sure that we have uh, the appropriate procedures and policies to be agile and listen to the marketplace uh, as well. So there's a really important balance uh, within all of that of uh, ensuring that we, uh, we work forward. Now, for example, uh, with the fourth industrial revolution, there is real opportunities for uh, accreditation to play a role um, in the Internet of Things or, for example, with uh, blockchain technology and the validation of, of the inputs and the outputs of data in blockchain. But in some aspects of, for example, IT coding or the, the way in which, uh, for example, blockchain coding is, is put together, there is little role really for accreditation, but especially because that area evolves so very, very quickly and is such a distinct and niche area. So back to my, my point again, it's about choosing the right areas and making sure that we focus on those first. Thank you very much, Matt, uh, for your contribution and uh, for answering those questions here. Uh, over to you, Anna. Yes, uh, we will soon go to Italy and the, the national accreditation body, Accredia, in Italy. But I think we need just a few moments uh, to connect to them. So in the meantime, um, I'm the curious newbie here in this area of accreditation. Uh, while Peter is uh, really experienced, so I will just take the time to, to ask you, what have you found most interesting so far? Oh, <laughs> that's hard to say, but I think just listen to, to those people with different experience. And uh, uh, for example, the researchers, we seldom see them here in, in our business. So that's very nice to hear that view. And of course, a big accreditation body giving their view of, of the situation, how they see it. That's very important and very good for uh, this discussion. And as uh, Ulf said uh, uh, earlier on, we are here not perhaps to give all the answers, but to, uh, to inspire and uh, take this discussion further. So we will have this in our general assemblies and, and the meetings in between also. Yeah, great. So are we ready to go to Italy? Yes. The national accreditation body in Italy, Accredia, has recently carried out research on the concrete value of accreditation. 
How much does accreditation contribute to society and business? Accredia has the answer in euros. We are pleased to welcome Emanuele Riva, Vice General Manager at Accredia and Vice Chair at IAF, and Alessandro Nisi, responsible for studies and statistics at Accredia. Over to Milan and Rome. Good morning, everybody. So thanks for, for the invitation. I will start uh, with a short presentation and after I will leave the floor to my colleague that is the person that developed the, the research that we are talking about today. So uh, first of all, I'd like to bring to you the greetings from uh, IF, the IF chair Xiao that was unable to attend to this meeting, but asked me to bring his welcome to, to all of you. Uh, so uh, here we have a, a short, a quick, uh, introduction of uh, the role of accreditation and the need of accreditation. Also, in, in before, Matt uh, had a, a good presentation of the value of accreditation. Here there is a summary of how Accredia is trying to uh, approach this in, in our team. Accredia is the national Italian accreditation body recognized by the government for, for this role. So we have, the, the main focus is the to improve the efficiency of, of the public administration, the efficiency in the market. So accreditation could be an instrument to simplify the bureaucracy and to deliver effective economic policies. The second point is for the companies, is focus on the productivity. And we can raise, we, we can demonstrate that accreditation and certification can raise the productivity, the innovation and the profitable investment. And the last not, but not least is the attention to the consumers, because here we can see that the, uh, the accreditation can raise up the, the trust. The, the main point of accreditation, I think, is the trust. Trust for all the parties. And so particularly for, for the consumer, here we have the, the best uh, benefit. For, for the next, yes. Why we are using data? First of all, to demonstrate what I said in the slide before. So they demonstrate the benefit on the efficiency, productivity, and transparency. So we have a number of these. It's the first time, I think, uh, that we can demonstrate with numbers these that so far were just only nice words. And uh, of course, this also can help uh, for us to, to demonstrate, to explain what we are talking about, what, what we are, what we do, what we have what. So this explain which is the value of the tick business. This allowed us to gain strategic positioning. If you speak with the, uh, with the journalist or if you speak with authority, with numbers, you can demonstrate that you are telling the truth. You are, they can trust you. And so data can help you to deliver a message, to deliver the message that they would like to say. However, you know that uh, to have data is not easy. Not easy at all, also in this field. And it takes time, it, it takes a lot of investment to have uh, reliable data. Uh, we just started to give us our experience. We started 20 years ago with this, uh, with this uh, journey. 20 years ago, we started to collect the information of the companies certified for managing system. And this was, we were lucky because we had the law in that period that forced the companies to publish their information on our website. This was the kickoff. So we have been able in that period to start to convince the government assessment body to give us the data. And so, so far we are the main point that uh, provide information on all the market uh, in, in Italy. Here we can, we can give you some numbers, numbers of data that we have in our database that are free, available for everybody, just with a click. Now you, you can see I cannot, uh, I don't, it's not necessary for me to read all the numbers, but uh, our huge that are increasing. We had just started a few months ago the product, and uh, today there are a few schemes that are included in this database, but this will include, will, will increase. For sure, products will be the future uh, for, for our database. Now it's easy to, to collect the data for companies, but it's not too easy to collect data for product because it changes, but it's absolutely needed. You can see 
what's happening now for for the face masks for for COVID, for example. The the that the product is a really value for for the trade. However, it's also also to to highlight the fact that we have been able to have a, a agreement, a, a dialogue with the third parties in considering on the database because there are authorities that are interested to have data. So we have in Italy the authority for public tender and construction. They reach from us directly the information. If a company is not in our database, they cannot attend, participate to tender. So it's fundamental to be in our database. Many banks are asking the data because they realize that the companies certified are more reliable than companies not certified. Research issues, the Chamber of Commerce, and so on. So uh, also the database provides us the possibility to have fast analysis and to have to, to understand the trend and to provide the, the right answer when, when it's needed. And, uh, and now I leave the floor to my colleague. We have been able to start a, a kind of observatory that is a, a, a series of research that were focusing on specific different fields. So, Alessandro, please. Okay. These are some of the recent researches uh, we performed on quality environment, occupational health safety. Uh, mainly on the effect, beneficial effect on users, uh, mainly enterprises, uh, of management system certification under accreditation, of course. But this analysis uh, have a strong limit. The limit is that uh, these are kind of simple uh, comparing analysis, uh, statistical descriptive analysis. So we just compare the certified companies with not certified companies uh, we studied uh, the balance sheet indicators uh, and we can see that uh, uh, certified companies uh, has better performances but uh, it, it doesn't say it doesn't say that uh, certification and accreditation justify these better performances so in the last year we try to go further and we try to to have an estimate, uh, an overall estimate of the quality infrastructure value in Italy for the Italian economy. And doing that, we borrowed uh, macro and microeconomic uh, models uh, to say that conformity assessment and accreditation and indirectly also, of course, standardization brings this, uh, uh, these results these uh, uh, benefits uh, on competitiveness, efficiency and transparency for CA users, uh, mainly enterprises. But also uh, we studied all the effects that go beyond uh, uh, conformity assessment users benefits uh, on occupational health and safety environment and food safety. Summing up all these factors, uh, we arrived uh, an, uh, on an estimate of quality infrastructure value in euro. These are the main results. Uh, I go for that. Uh, so conformity assessment matters. Uh, it is an investment uh, for enterprises uh, and it has an impact on sustainability. In numbers, we can say that 10.8 billion euro value added are explained of the growth of value added in the period 2013-2018 are explained by certification, testing and accreditation, of course. Also, uh, we could say uh, that uh, uh, a, there is an increase in the turnover due to certification among enterprises, certified enterprises as respect to the non-certified ones, uh, between 2.5 and 18.1%, depending on the sector analyzed and on the certification scheme, of course. And also that there is a productivity differential between certified and non-certified manufacturing and exporting companies uh, between 1.4 and 18.8 thousand of euros. But also we could say that uh, the effects that goes beyond uh, conformity assessment users uh, are that uh, uh, there is a less uh, uh, emission of CO2 equivalent uh, due to the certification in the energy and environmental fields, 
of 13.72 million tons, and also 6,000 fewer injuries due to, due to the adoption of a certified management system. So this is the um, uh, the the detail of the 10.8 billion euro value added of the contribution of value added in the period 2013-2018 in the splitted in a, in a sector we analyzed the manufacturing services and construction sector but also here we can see that the benefit for the certified companies uh, uh, as expect the non certified ones uh, lasts over the years, if you look at the, if you focus on the uh, right side, right hand side of the of the slide, the line graph, the yellow line are the certified companies, the blue line are the non-certified control sample. We say that because these control sample are companies that are not certified but are. Uh, totally uh, identical uh, to the certified ones. The, the, the only factor that differentiated them is the certification. So you can see that this, uh, uh, this impact on the turnover persists over the years. And in this table, we sum up all the effects in terms of uh, reduction of external costs. So uh, summing up, all the annual social benefits, uh, the, the externalities we, we said, on environment, energy, workplace safety, food safety, and some EU directives. That is uh, uh, annually social benefit uh, of uh, 1.3 billion euro. And the important thing is that the important message we can deliver to the institutions is that in Italy is that uh, the benefit of 1.3 billion euro doubled the costs incurred by companies for obtaining and maintaining certification. And we are now considering here uh, the private profits in terms of turnover of the certified companies. So to say that uh, an expansion of the diffusion of uh, these tools could further amplify uh, a positive impact, social uh, positive impact and this is very and a very important message to say to the our ministries and other associations and also lastly i will, will i'll tell you something about this agreement the renewable three years agreement between isat and acredia isat is the uh, uh, national st uh, statistical uh, institution in italy uh, this agreement has uh, two goals mainly, that is to enhance Acredia's database and contribute to the national statistical production. And uh, within this agreement, uh, we performed an analysis on exporting companies with ISTAT that says that uh, this is another important message we delivered. Uh, there is a productivity differential between uh, certified and non-certified manufacturing exporting companies and this differential increase as the size of the enterprises lowered. So for SMEs is, a, is a, something special to say, is a particularly important asset, the certification, of course. And also, lastly, uh, this message, uh, it's not Acredia saying that, it's ISTAT that elaborates on our data and says that in an institutional uh, and um, way that uh, doesn't involve us actually, it's I start working on our and their data. So what's next? Uh, we are opening a channel of communication with policymakers uh, in the sense that we uh, sent uh, to our institutional mailing list the research, of course. And uh, we are working on a document, uh, an institutional document that emphasizes uh, the, the tools of uh, quality infrastructure in Italy uh, and presents some of the main results uh, of uh, this last research. Uh, now we can demonstrate that what we do matters as an impact on the economy and on society. And this uh, fits with IAF strategy, that accreditation makes the work better. 
And uh, also I can say that uh, this research was sent by IAF in their newsletter. And also that UNIDO published it on, on, on its, that, uh, on its uh, uh, website. Okay, and that's all. I'm here as uh, Manuela for answering any questions. Andrew, and thank you, Emanuele. That's a great presentation with a lot of concrete facts. So thanks a lot. Uh, I will just start with, uh, we've had uh, several questions from the audience actually, but one is very uh, direct and is asking, uh, will the presentations be handed out afterwards? And the answer to that is yes. So I just want to reassure yeah. you on that point. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. Please keep sending us uh, questions. It's very inspiring and good for the conversations. But back to you again, uh, Alessandro yeah. uh, and Emanuel, of course. Um, you, you mentioned a bit about how the results have been presented, but could you tell us that again, please? How were they presented and how have they been received? Uh, uh, well, okay, I, I can answer. I, I listen and echo. Anyway, uh, well, we send it uh, to all uh, our uh, mailing list. So we send it uh, th these results. We send it uh, to the uh, to the cabs, of course, to the association of, uh, in Italy that are uh, associates in uh, in Acredia, and also to our ministries. We have uh, uh, direct communication channels with some. Um, people in the ministries uh, so we presented these results and uh, as i told you uh, um, i we are working on a document an institutional document named uh, maybe something like uh, accreditation and conformity assessments uh, for public policies so what we like to to deliver the message we'd like to deliver is that quality infrastructure could be a tool to deliver effective uh, policies. So a tool for efficiency for the public administration. And uh, th th this is from the institutional point of view, uh, but of course for enterprises, uh, we, we, can, we can say that uh, certification is a, a, a competitive tool, is a, it's a tool to, to gain market position, it's a tool to control costs and to, to raise productivity, of course. And in particular for exporting companies that is very important for Italian economy, of course. Have you had any reactions that you would like to share? Uh, no, uh, uh, not really. Not, uh, not at the moment. Uh, we have to we have to talk with the uh, with the um, economic development ministry in uh, next weeks, and uh, about about this also. And, uh, I hope to have a uh, positive uh, feedback from them. And of course, I had a lot of positive feedbacks. Uh, by other research institutes, as I said, of course, but also from universities and, and others. Great. If I can add something. We are, in these days, uh, for the COVID, uh, all the countries is talking about the recovery fund that is granted to the country. So we are starting a dialogue with the ministry to connect this recovery fund in some way with accreditation. So this money that will arrive to the companies has to be uh, controlled, has to be managed carefully. So accreditation could be a tool to help this control. Mm. That is, this is the way we are approaching this now. Mm, I see. That's a very like acute issue to, to handle, so it's good mm. input there. Okay. So thank you very much for, for great, great uh, presentations and uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Anna, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. An important aspect of, of the accreditation system is multilateral agreements, MLAs. They are fundamental for effective global trade. Having said that, the MLA structure is both taken for granted and at the same time so complex that few fully understands it. Dr. Stefan Finke, 
the managing director of the German accreditation body DAX. We'll talk about the importance of MLA status and how it affects international trade in Germany. Dr. Finke has been with DAX since 2016. He has previously held manager positions at ABB. Over to Germany. If we can, yeah. Take some time, yeah. But yeah. Uh, very interesting, the Italian way of handling the, the funds. That yes, we'll exactly. Yeah. I think so too. And one question that I didn't ask, but that was on my in my mind is uh, if it's important to have that kind of competence. I'm thinking about Alessandro Nisi, who can perform that kind of analysis. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's a very interesting question because uh, uh, people working in the accreditation community tends to be more technicians uh, and focused on, on the content of the accreditation. But of course, the output is really something that we should uh, take a look at. Yeah. So I think we have uh, Germany with us. So, over to you, Stefan. Yeah, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Peter, for the nice introduction. And uh, let me say it is an honor to, uh, for DAX to participate on this important uh, webinar of uh, SWEDAC. Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to my presentation about the importance of the multilateral arrangement status. It's important for um, economies, it's important for conformity assessment bodies, and of course, it's also important for uh, the national accreditation bodies. Before I start, I would like to introduce a little bit about the European and international accreditation organizations. And uh, these are the organization who provides the MLAs and MRAs. Um, short explanation about these two abbreviations. Um, there is no really a difference between MLAs and MRAs, but uh, these uh, different organizations had slight diff different wordings about these mutual recognition arrangements, and therefore some of them are called MLAs and MRAs, but in principle there is not really a difference in between. Let's talk about membership and goals. I think all European uh, accreditation bodies are full members of uh, the European Accreditation Corporation of IIF and ILAC. And by this, they are also signatory of the multilateral arrangement systems. The goal of the international uh, cooperation is that if you are accredited once, this accreditation is accepted everywhere. And what we want to, what we, uh, want to uh, try to achieve is that we have a worldwide acceptance of conformity assessment results through the accreditation. And this leads to one step ahead that it can be rephrased this sentence by tested once or certified once accepted everywhere. And by this, the accreditation bodies wants to contribute, contribute to reduce technical barriers to the international trade. Just a short words about ILAC and IIF. ILAC is the International Laboratory Accreditation Cooperation, and this organization deals, let's say, with all kinds of laboratories. We have laboratories for calibration, for testing, for medical laboratories, for inspection bodies, for proficiency testing providers. And you see behind uh, the special laboratories the number of the ISO IEC standard. For example, for calibration and testing, it's the ISO 17025. And we have, on the other hand, the another large uh, organization. Uh, Emanuela is the vice president of IIF, the International Accreditation Forum. They are mainly dealing with all kinds of certification bodies. So certification for products, for management systems, for persons, and also for validation and verification systems. The mutual recognition arrangements or the multilateral recognition arrangements have both the same uh, 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 reason. We want to ensure that certificates and test reports are accepted in principle by all signatories for of the arrangement. And therefore, the presumption is necessary 
that all MLA signatories, so all the ABEs, apply the same requirements for the accreditation of their conformity assessment bodies. So the assessment of the competence of a conformity assessment body is comparable worldwide. But there's one major uh, point you have to know. IAF MLAs and ILAC MRAs are not legally binding for governments, but they create a confidence. And by this, we shall build a basis for mutual recognition in the international trade agreements. Coming one level down to the European level, the European Cooperation for Accreditation is the association of the national accreditation bodies in Europe. So EA is namely the accreditation infrastructure in, within the EU. And um, together with the European Free Trade Association and four EU candidate countries. So all national accreditation bodies belonging to one of these countries can become a full member of EA. But there's a difference to the ILAC and IIF uh, system because the European Commission has delegated central tasks to EA and they have done that by a regulation which is called 765 and coming out of the year 2008. The goal of the Commission was clearly to harmonize and support further development of the accreditation system in Europe by ensuring quality, transparency and independence of the system. And to ensure that, they want to manage EA, the peer evaluation system. So what is uh, about peer evaluation? It is the regular evaluation of all national accreditation bodies by EA. EA shall ensure that all accreditation bodies inside EA fulfill the same conditions to assess, regularly survey and attest technical competence of the conformity assessment bodies. And to prove that the assessment are based and the assessment for the uh, um, accreditation bodies are based on the same assessment criteria, and they are referred in particular to the international standard ISO IC 17011. So in the same way we are assessing, for example, a laboratory according to 17025, EA is assessing us as ABs whether or not we are complying with the requirements of the 17011. And beside that, we have a legal basis. And this legal basis is the Article 10 of the Regulation 765. And coming from the peer evaluation, we are coming to the multilateral arrangement of EA, the EA MLA. And in principle, we have the same thing as in ILAC and IAF. It's about the recognition of equivalence and reliability of accreditations on the one hand and accreditation conformity assessment results on the other hand. Of course, in, in both cases, only for the signatory of these MLAs. The requirement to obtain the EA MLA status, as I said, is to successfully undergo the EA peer evaluation. And um, a peer evaluation to that, just to show you what is about or what is behind a peer evaluation, uh, the peer evaluation of DAX uh, the last time lasted two times one week, so in in fact two weeks, and there were around about uh, fifteen to uh, six, fifteen to seventeen people um, coming from all other uh, accreditation bodies in Europe, which are looking and 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 the uh, uh, working and uh, the processes of DAX and uh, have a look uh, what we are doing good and uh, where we have maybe some things we can improve the presumption of conformity of accreditation bodies according to the regulation in this case is different to the ILAC and uh, uh, IIF MLAs because if you are a member of um, the EA MLA, national authorities of the UA, uh, EU have to recognize and accept on the accreditation certificates on one hand, and of course also that uh, the uh, attestation issued by conformity assessment bodies 
which are accredited by us. So when you have no legal binding um, for authorities inside uh, IIF and um, ILAC, um, you have here a clear uh, uh, legal binding for the national authorities inside the EU. And finally, if you have uh, passed uh, the provisions to become an EAMLA signatory, then of course it is also then possible Consequence of losing the MLA status is it uh, uh, is there really a need or is is there benefit uh, of doing all the work? So then let's show that uh, on on the next uh, slides. Of course, we have some legal consequences. So the presumption of the conformity according to Article 11 of the regulation is not given anymore. So what does that mean? We have no recognition of the accreditation certificates on one hand. But even worse, all the conformity assessment uh, bodies which have issued uh, test certificates or certificates test results, which were accredited by this uh, body, were also not recognized internationally anymore. Another point is accreditation quite often is a basis to or something to underpin notification inside Europe. So the notification bodies rely on the accreditation. So if this accreditation is not given or not recognized internationally anymore, also the notification cannot be uh, based on this accreditation. So the notification body has to establish a second way to uh, notify their bodies, which is of course a duplication of uh, time and cost. And the conformity assessment bodies which are located in the member state of the accreditation body will seek for cross-border accreditations according to another uh, article of the regulation. And this will have, of course, consequences for the accreditation body beside a serious damage of, uh, uh, of the rep reputation of the uh, AB. We have uh, to face as an AB considerable restrictions in the operation on the, uh, uh, on the market. Because as our uh, accreditation is not recognized internationally anymore, as I said, the conformity assessment bodies can seek for cross-border accreditations, which of course means then that the accreditation body will lose enormous amount of business. And in the uh, um, uh, final consequence, this can risk the existence of the body. And we have another point. Normally, the conformity assessment bodies rely on the MLA of its uh, home AB. So if this is gone, then the conformity assessment bodies may uh, claim damages um, on, the, on the AB because they have now uh, additional efforts and maybe additional risks. And, there, and by this, I will come to the consequences for the conformity assessment bodies. The loss of the recognized accreditation will lead to a direct loss of turnover for the conformity assessment bodies itself because the manufacturers who want to test, for example, their products, they want to have these test certificates accepted internationally. And when this is not given anymore, they will look for a different or for another conformity assessment body. And this will, of course, uh, lead to the direct loss of turnover for the caps. And in the next step, these um, uh, conformity assessment bodies will seek for cross-border accreditations. Cross-border accreditation means more time, more costs, and of course, in certain cases, some language barriers. So it makes the whole process much more difficult. In regulated areas, you may lose the possibility to operate in this, in this area or only to a very limited extent. For example, in Germany, it's quite often the case that uh, it's written in the law that you have to have 
um, accreditation by an MLA signatory AB to operate on this market. When this is not given anymore because the AB has lost the MLA status, you are also not allowed to operate in the sector anyway, anymore. So the whole market for the conformity assessment is endangered. And to add one number to all the numbers you have already heard by uh, uh, our friends from Italy, um, the dimension of the conformity assessment market, only of this market, which was uh, elaborated in, in Germany in 2015, the last time, there was total revenues for around about 11.5 billion euros, only for the conformity assessment. It's not about all the rest uh, um, for the economy. And coming to the economy, this is um, the last point, and uh, I think the most important and the most important dangerous, because the main point to place products on, 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 on the market in foreign countries and the the system of free movements of products and, and services uh, is impaired because the placing of products in foreign markets depends whether or not applicable requirements of the products are met also in the import country. And this could be a little bit dangerous to the home country. So you have now two possibilities. Either you test these uh, um, uh, products um, in the um, import country and if you have several import countries, you have to do it in every of these countries or you do it once in your home country. And by this, the accreditation ensures that the test results are also accepted in all the other countries. But this is also uh, only the case um, as long as the accreditation body is internationally accepted. So if this is not the case anymore, then um, the accreditation uh, 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 or uh, the the, the uh, um, products have to be tested twice or three times or whatever, and this is of course a severe burden for all manufacturers and service providers, and especially for small and medium-sized uh, enterprises, because in these cases the tests for costs are uh, in, in 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 the percentage even higher. So this is um, everything what I can tell you on consequences of this system of internationally uh, um, uh, quality infrastructure and the MLA. And um, thank you what, very much for your, uh, for your listening. And of course, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free. Thank you, Stefan, for your interesting presentation. Uh, since you have some experience in discussing this with uh, your stakeholders in Germany, what's your advice to other national accreditation bodies how to discuss the importance of the MLA status? Um, I think it's crucial to explain the system of the quality infrastructure. So the, I think the meaning of accreditation is not really well understood, neither in industry nor in politics, because this principle tested once, accredited, uh, uh, tested, no, tested once, accepted everywhere. This is quite known in, uh, uh, at the stakeholder value at the stakeholders but when you think then what is the or what is the the, the 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 need or what is necessary to 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 have this tested once accepted everywhere that there is an accreditation and the and an mla behind this is not really uh, well known and you need to explain this to stakeholders to politics uh, quite uh, uh, yeah uh, quite often i think Okay, thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for your contribution. Um, it was a pleasure, thank you. Thank you, Stefan, and all other speakers for great presentations, and uh, thank you to everyone listening in. We will now take a short break, but do not forget to make your voice heard in our Menti poll. We will close the poll half an hour before our closing debate, so make sure to vote during the breaks. Uh, in our second part, after the break, we will come back with the user perspective on the value of accreditation. We will be back at a quarter to three. Thank you. Next webinar on the value of accreditation. In this part two, we will investigate the value of accreditation from a user perspective. We are sorry that we are two minutes late. We had some technical problems. 
I also want to mention, as we had questions about it, that the Menti poll is located in the fact box below. You need to scroll down a little bit and look for the headline, Make Your Voice Heard. So please do that. Thank you. We have two interviews before us. We will talk to Johan Wallin, who is compliance officer at the Swedish Gambling Authority. And we will talk to Stefan Bertilsson, who is quality manager at IKEA Test Lab in Elmhult, Småland. Accreditation is mandatory for one of the areas and voluntary for the other. Which pros and cons do they experience? Welcome to this part two, where we will explore the value of accreditation from a user perspective. We turn to the Gambling Authority first. Welcome, Johan Wallin. Johan has a long history within the organization. He has worked for the authority since 1997. Today he is compliance officer. His daily job is to audit applications and reports from gambling companies and operators who want to enter the Swedish market. So Johan, we have listeners from all around the world. Could you please describe what the Swedish gambling market looks like? The Swedish gambling market looks like this. Since 2019, have the gambling market in Sweden open to an international market. It means that we have a lot of international game gambling companies in the market acting under a new gambling act. The act's focus on three different areas. Commercial online gambling, state-owned gambling, and gambling for purpose for public interest. That's the most important part of the act. Okay, thank you. Uh, could you please describe the Gambling Authority's role? What type of organization are you? And what's your purpose on the Swedish gambling market? We are uh, authorities. So, so we are state-owned, of course. Uh, we are authority to give license to the companies who can fulfill the demands in the, act, in the, in the Gambling Act. We also supervise the business that have been given a license. As a gambler in Sweden, you should be aware of that the market is reliable and take responsibility, especially according to responsible gambling. That's the purpose of the act. New legislation came into force uh, in 2019. The use of, accre uh, of accreditation is linked to that new legislation. Uh, could you describe why accreditation came in, in use on the gambling market at this point? The gambling business is not harmonized in the EU. Every country have their own technical standards. When Sweden opened up to an international market, it wouldn't be possible to continue work as we did before. Now we have international companies that's used to work with accreditation. Accreditation is necessary both for a gambling authority because of the reduce of the cost for the authority. It also makes it simpler for the gambling company that can test for many gambling markets at the same time by, by contacting a credit body. It's a win-win situation both for the authority and for the gambling in business. Could you tell us a little bit about the background? Which tool was used before 2019 and why the change really? Before the gambling authority work with some what called type approval, that means that every system that a gambling company was using was supervised by authority and every drawing equipment was tested by us. It was a lot of time that we spent on that. We also made code reviewing on important code that we outsourced to external companies. Before that, we e copied every transaction was made by the state-owned companies. It means that if a player plays a bet uh, at the state-owned company, the bet was spared in their system, and after that, it was sent to our system. When the market opened up, it would have been impossible to maintain that kind of a system. Okay, so what kind of challenge uh, did the Swedish government want to solve by the change then? Before, we had a huge amount of gambling companies that provide Swedish market with internet gambling without a gambling license. Before, they, they, only had a, they couldn't have a license. So now when it opened up, they could have a license. The new act make it possible for them to act legally. Today is the number of games provided from, Swe from a Swedish license is about 85%. 
of the whole gambling market in Sweden. The responsible gam gambling was a big part of the new legislation. With a national tool that called spelpost.se, can the gambler who want to take part take part of the gambling business who don't want to take part of the gambling business ban themselves from gambling. As we speak, there are 57,000 Swedish persons who have banned them from gambling. The purpose was also to ban gambling companies that not have a license in Sweden. We are hunting the 15 missing persons. Okay. So what's your experience of, of accreditation so far? Any pros and cons, strengths or weakness? Yeah, it's always difficult to understand the new market. For an accredited body point of view, some problems are about what accredited body can do, what kind of report they can do. We are asking reports during information security, change management, r and reports, and game reports for certain games. And uh, that's only as, as some examples. From the license point of view, they have, uh, they is to adapt a new system. The licensee has different experience to contact the accredited body. The companies in Sweden who uh, were working uh, behind the old act was not used to contact the uh, accredited body at all. And from the gaming authorities point of view, a lot of new companies and new legislations. Personally, I find it's very difficult to find the essence in every report because I read lots of reports. Uh, the strengths of the system, this, this, this lower the cost for the authority. And all testing is done by the protocol by a accredited body. That means that we, we, we understand it better and we're doing the same way all the time. The weakness of the system, if I, it's difficult for small public organizations to find polite accredited bodies because they are not so used to have accredited bodies is normally international. And if you're a local business, it's very difficult for them to start to speak mm -hmm. English and things like that. Okay. It's also easy that the cost for the license grows because of the low experience to talk to accredited bodies. If a licensee have poor knowledge of how the order test is easy that the costs going high are getting high, huge. Okay. So is there anything from the old process from 2019 that you missed today? Yeah, we understand the problem for the small gambling business. It's the small gambling business, mostly local bingo in small communities. But as we speak, we work to make the demands easier for the small gaming business. They who are selling, selling in small areas with low profit to organization and have low prices for the players. The new system is here. And I think this is a road, is a way of no return, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So, in your opinion, is the system working? Are you where you want to be with the accreditation system? Uh, it's too close to declare if the system is working or not. The act will be, will be revived by other authorities. In the system, we demand that the licensees upgrade their reporting every year, but without to send in the reports to us. This autumn, we make a supervision from some of the licensees if they have made an upgrade of the reporting. Another point of view is that the government have made some adjustments to the law that have forced the licensee to minimum the spend for each player in a week. This, according to the Arise, is online gambling. The Arise in online gambling from the COVID-19 situation. They have forced some of the licensees, licensees to let the accreditation body make another review of the reports. But again, I think the system will be permanent and it will not change again. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, if you if you could wish, how would you like the accreditation system to evolve? We need some changes in the law to make it possible to have the business to business license, and then that will reduce some costs for the licensee, licensee who use that. I also noticed that the changing is in the way to, that accredited body can change their objectives. With that will make the accreditation producer producer easier for an accredited body. So, okay, f uh, finally then, uh, which value would you say that accreditation adds to the Swedish gambling market today? Yeah, uh, I, then I think I repeat that I already said, it's, it's lower the cost for the authority, mm. and the, the testing is done by the protocol by accredited bodies. They're doing the same way and under accreditation. That's the main plus, okay. I think. Yeah. Thank you very much, Johan. Great. Thanks.
We now turn to Stefan Bertilsson, a quality manager at IKEA Test Lab in Småland. Uh, Stefan has a background from Nibe with quality work. Nibe is a Swedish company selling indoor climate systems for private homes. Stefan has been quality manager at IKEA Test Lab since 2012. And the Test Lab, as mentioned, is located in Elmhult, which is close to the its neighbor to the headquarters of IKEA. Welcome, Stefan. Thank you very much. Thank you. And it's also thank you for, uh, for us to participate in this. It was uh, hopefully give you all uh, good information on what we are doing here in Elmhult. Yes, it's great. We are really pleased to have you. Uh, IKEA as a brand is uh, very famous. Uh, I think it's fair to say that everyone knows uh, that IKEA sells furniture, if one <coughs> puts it very simply. But I think it's also fair to say that the test, lab, the test labs are not as well known. Uh, could you please tell us a bit about the labs? I know you have two, uh, one in Elmhult, where you are quality manager, and one in Shanghai, China. So please tell us a bit about them. Yes, IKEA, they uh, have two labs, their own two lab sites, and one is located here in Elmhult, the other one is in Shanghai. Uh, the lab here in Elmhult, we are very close to the product development, uh, so we are combined as a development test laboratory, and also that we are supporting of uh, uh, the material and surface and all the new we things that we use on our products. That is what we are test here. And then our test lab in Shanghai, it's named IKEA Test and Consulting uh, Services in Shanghai, has the focus on production verification. So products are sent from our supplier to the laboratory in Shanghai to verify the production of our products. Great, oh. I see. So they have a bit of different roles then. We will focus on uh, the lab in, in Elmhult today, obviously. Yeah. So, uh, which role would you say the lab in, in Elmhult plays for IKEA? It's a very important role because we are in the beginning of uh, everything here uh, that we secure our products so they are safe for our customer to use. Um, but then our laboratory in Shanghai, they secure our products uh, in, in the production phase. So both lab is very, very important for IKEA. Yes. Uh, you, you just mentioned uh, safety. Would you say that you focus on, on quality or is it safety? On both. We focus on both. And that's a very big focus for IKEA. That is uh, very important for us. As at the lab uh, to uh, have good quality and safe products for our customer. We are in direct support to product development to secure safe and healthy products and through testing and simulation, verify construction, dimensioning and choice of correct material for different markets. Could you tell us a little bit more about there, what, what you test? I've actually seen a, a videotape uh, which is shown on, on YouTube on what you do. It's very like you open and close doors a million times and you scratch things over surfaces. Could you tell us what, what kind of data is it that you collect? Uh, we select uh, all data more or less uh, on different materials. Uh, the behavior, the formability, and lots of other things. Uh, all this data we can use for simulation and calculation. Uh, we also collect data on how products perform under the test. Uh, we have uh, the mechanical testing here that uh, we try to simulate how our customer use our product. And of course, we always follow the international standard, how we should perform the test. And then IKEA have higher requirement than we have in the standard. And then we have to follow that also. Right. And the labs are accredited to ISO 17025. Uh, could you tell us why did IKEA decide to take this step? 
it's uh, it's very important for uh, for the laboratory to have a certificate that uh, we are approved as the laboratory that we are doing in correct way we have an organization that we do we working according to the international standard we uh, it, it's a, i think it's a, a a trust for our customer to have an accredited uh, um, laboratory when did the accreditation become effective? As soon it was implemented and it was a, a, a tool for our, our employees uh, that we can use in our daily work. Then it be affected, uh, effective uh, and, and um, it takes little time to set up the organization and follow all the routines and that things but when we have done that it's it's an easy work because that's a normal behavior every day and and when was this in time uh, i think the first one uh, 1996 and and you started working there as quality manager in 2012 is it possible for you to say what difference has the accreditation made for the test labs uh, Accreditation for companies is very important, I said it before also. They give us as a laboratory a certificate and trust and evidence as a laboratory to our customer. Uh, we had it well organized and then we have uh, uh, authorities here every 60 months to check that we are doing in, in correct way and it's very good to have them here because then we can have a lot of improvement we may we need to do and a lot of discussions around a lot of routines and a lot of our processes, how we are doing it. So you find uh, there is a development there in, in the discussions <coughs> on your process? That's, yeah. That's okay. also my input to, uh, to Svedak, to be more a support function to the company to help us with um, to do in correct way. Of course, they are already doing that, but it's very important that they, they do that because it can be uh, a miss in how we read our standards, how we do the uh, in interpretation of the standard. So be a good support is very useful for us. So is that what you find is missing in, in this uh, process? Or would you like to add something? Uh, uh, we, we have a very good uh, connection with uh, the auditors who come to IKEA and um, uh, yeah, we can, the situation we have this year when we have the audit here was a new thing for us, but I see it's very, very good to use more movies to show uh, them how we do the test. And uh, I think that can be maybe the future for Sverak also to do it in a more simple way, because that reduced the cost for both of us. Yes, so the pandemic had that positive impact on, on your process. Yeah, that's that also. Yeah, absolutely. Great, I just have another question which came in from the audience. Uh, yeah. So how do the quality infrastructure of the two labs interact? Um, the, the, the quality is, yeah, we we say that we we, are, we secure all the product from the beginning. In in the beginning phase, before we start the production, we secure it and it's approved by us then to start the production. And then it's the same for for our other labs in Shanghai. They secure the production, so we don't have. Uh, bad products in uh, in uh, our stores and yep. together we work very close together with a lot of uh, information and cooperation between us so different parts of the process then absolutely in the beginning and in the end great thank you stefan we will uh, bring in Johan Wallin from the swedish gambling authority again and please stay stefan so we can just make a short summary together uh, on the pros and cons of accreditation yep. for the yep. both of you. So if you just sit tight there. Okay, I will do that. Great.
And meanwhile, yeah, perfect. There we have the both of you. Welcome back, Johan. Thank you. So to summarize, if the both of you could, and I will start with you, Johan, uh, if you could say in one or two sentences, just what do you find is the value of accreditation from your perspective, please? To maintain the Swedish Gambling Act, purpose in technical demands, it's absolutely necessary that the gambling companies and subcontractors directly can contact an accredited body who have correct accreditation. Uh, it had been impossible to make all that work that we have accredited bodies to do by ourselves in a cost-effective way. So, for our point of view, we need uh, more accredited bodies, I think. Great, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> and over to you, Stefan. What do you find is the most valuable thing in the accreditation process from your point of view? Uh, it's, uh, it's for us, it's uh, many things. It mean for us to have the, to be an accredited test laboratory. It gives us uh, a good cooperation with other laboratories. We have uh, a steering uh, tool for us to be a good uh, good laboratory working according to international standards and then it's a, a proof that uh, we have a good organization and, and a good laboratory. Great. I would just yeah. act, add one thing that IKEA test laboratories they, they look the site in uh, Shanghai and Elmwood's not the only laboratories IKEA have. We have over 100 uh, approved laboratory to support the production. Thanks. That's a good clarification. Thank you. Yeah. And just a final question then. Uh, you both mentioned it, but in short, what kind of development would you like to see from your perspective within accreditation for the future? I can start with you, Stefan, please. Um, yeah, it's the, to make it a little more simple. When we have uh, new methods to to uh, we want to have uh, accredited, uh, use movies, and then of course uh, uh, the costs, reduce the cost. Yeah, so simplification, communication, and cost. Yeah. Then I go to you, one. What kind of development would you like to see from your perspective, please? I'm not in the details how you can refine the accreditation, but I know at some point it can help the gaming business. It we can change the law to perform a business to business license. It's something that we can uh, be rising to the law. That's something that we have rising to the lawmaker. But uh, during this uh, presentation, I also can uh, ask Stefan if he maybe can apply for accreditation for the gambling <laughs> equipment. Uh, it would be a huge impact for small lotteries in Sweden, I think. What do you think about that, Stefan? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. So the two of you, you can talk afterwards. We are looking forward to that, follow that it's discussion. Fine, yeah, of <laughs> thank you. Thank you, both of you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We will now take a short break. Welcome back to our third part, where we will explore the future of accreditation. And you can have an impact on the future right now. Take part in the Manti poll. Uh, which question you find most important for the accreditation world to, for the future? Scroll down and vote. We will close the poll when the program starts again. Welcome back to Swedex webinar on the value of accreditation, the third and final part. We have looked at the value of accreditation from a European pers pers perspective. We have investigated the value of accreditation to two Swedish organizations. Now it's time to look at the future. We are pleased to introduce Marcus Long. He is chief executive at the IIOC. The organization is a global members organization with 10 international certification bodies connected to them. The organization's role is to represent the members' view. Marcus Long is here to talk about the future demands of the market. The certification bodies are close to the market. In their view, what needs to be done within accreditation for the, for the concept to stay relevant? Marcus Long can work from anywhere in the world, but today I think it's London. That's right. Hi, Anna. Hello, Peter. Um, congratulations on the uh, event today. You're both doing a good job. If this whole accreditation or communications thing 
doesn't work out for you. I understand there's an annual European singing competition. You could always uh, switch to doing hosting that instead. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, as you've uh, introduced me, I'm uh, chief executive of IOC, uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about them in a minute. Uh, I also have a number of different hats, um, and this photograph illustration illustrates one of those that uh, at the uh, IF, I am the representative um, um, on the board and the executive committee representing the CB Association members. Um, but it's today as IOC that I'm talking to you. And as uh, has been mentioned, IOC is a, uh, a trade association made up of uh, 10 global certification bodies who provide a huge range of different uh, activities around certification and at a group level uh, across the whole of the tick industry. Um, and uh, what that enables us to do is have a very clear perspective across the globe uh, of all the different demands and needs of our customers. So what I'd like to talk about is uh, kind of three key time periods in terms of market demands uh, and the way that the market is going. And uh, obviously, we'll start with the short term as the first one of those three. Uh, we hear lots of cliches about the world we're living in at the moment, the new now, the new normal, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and for us, I think there's something that's very, very clear. And that is that in this particular moment in time, what we must do is we must make sure that we are protecting the certifications and the accreditations that our community is responsible for. And that means doing it in two ways. One, that means that we must keep certificates live, but also we must make sure that the efficacy of those accredited certifications is maintained. We have to maintain the faith in what our stakeholders, our customers, our regulators understand accreditation and certification actually do for them. So it's vitally important that at this moment in time when we're going through some very significant changes, that we fulfill both of those two things, live certifications, live accreditations, but also that those, are, those still maintain the trust in them. So what has happened to us over the last few months? Well, I think, first of all, if we look at an IAF level, we can see that IAF had actually done a very good job in preparedness. All those meetings in uh, darkened rooms as people from across the globe met uh, regularly to plan out what we should be doing, to plan out the documents and the processes and the procedures, I think we can solidly say that uh, they have worked extremely well at adapting very, very rapidly to a completely different environment that we're now working. But not only did we see some solid preparedness, but also we've seen some very good responsiveness from uh, the accreditation community working alongside the certification bodies. Whether it's statements put out by these groups, whether it's uh, regular updates, on exactly what IAF is doing, and also the development of a frequently asked questions system, which brought together um, all the key people, all the key stakeholders involved in IAF, accreditation bodies, certification bodies, users, to make sure that the key questions that existed as we switched how we were operating as both certification bodies and accreditation bodies still maintain those two key principles of live certifications and, and accreditations plus a robust efficacy so people actually believed in what we were doing. So I think in terms of market demands, um, we've met the immediate short-term issues that have been thrown at us out of the pandemic through that preparedness and through that responsiveness. But we've got more to do. We've always got more to do, even in the short term. I think it's vital that we keep working very closely together, whether that's IF 
accreditation bodies, certification bodies. The strength we have built is through both independence and interdependence. We need to make sure that all of those different bodies have their specific roles, that the accreditation bodies are there accrediting the certification bodies to make sure that they are doing the right thing so that trust is built in what we're doing. That by working together, what we can also end up doing is making sure that we build something stronger. And one of the things that we must do is we must work hard at communicating. Because we have such a significant change at the moment, as we've switched an awful lot of our work in auditing and assessment from on-site to online, we need to make sure that all those customers and stakeholders are with us. We need to make sure that we're educating them about what we're doing. We're explaining them, explaining to them what we're doing. But I think we've also got to infuse in them what we're doing as well. We have to show them that what we're doing now works, that it provides the assurances, the trust that they need in our system. And ultimately, groups like consumers have faith in the certification, certifications and the accreditations that they see. So I think there's a lot more work to be done. But if we can do that collectively, if we can work together with standardizers, certification and accreditation, we can make sure that we actually support those customers, that we make sure that each one of those different elements stand on its own and does a positive drop, job. But when we come together, we make an even stronger job and a much better ability to support all of those people that need what we provide. So, yes, there's some positives out of the current pandemic. Yes, there's more we need to do. But we also need to look ahead. And if we look in the short term, in the medium term, what we need to do is we need to make sure that we're learning the lessons out of what's happened over the last seven or eight months. And let's face it, regrettably, what will no doubt still be carrying on as we move ahead, not just the rest of this year, but probably into 2021 as well. So we must make sure that we review, we learn the lessons and we implement the right things going forward as well. And I think listening is such an important part of that. Um, it's kind of regrettably refreshing to hear the things that we've just heard um, from some of your Swedish colleagues about what they do. We maybe need to hear some more about that to understand what they think is right, but also what they think they'd like to see done better by us. And that does mean we have to go back to those darkened rooms as well, that maybe we do have to uh, look at documents, look at our processes, look at our procedures, and actually review them to make sure that they are the right documents, providing exactly the right answers. We're out there selling to the world improvement, and let's make sure that we continue to do that ourselves. And we need to make sure that this responsiveness is not just about an individual component within the quality infrastructure. It's not just about certification bodies. It's not just about accreditation bodies. It's not just about the global organizations. But actually, we do that collectively as well. We need to work on our own sometimes, but actually coming together and, and coming up with that responsiveness in the medium term is important that we do that together. And I have no doubt that we can do better and more preparedness for the future. We don't know exactly what's around the corner. I know we'd all love a crystal ball to know exactly what's going to happen. But actually, as we've seen from how we've responded to this uh, pandemic, a lot of that response was based on the preparedness we've done and how we're actually able to slot in our plans, our processes and our procedures and our policies to make sure that we can support customers and stakeholders, businesses, governments, consumers, to make sure we're as ready as we possibly could be to help them out. And we need to make sure we do that for the future as well. So I think that's a vital thing that we start thinking about, learning the lessons and preparing for what could be something next. If that's the medium term, then the longer term gives us even more challenges because it makes it more difficult for us to actually understand what's going to happen. But first of all, if we talk about 
the lessons from the pandemic. What we've clearly seen is that restrictions that have been placed on all of us have meant that we haven't been able to do the on-site auditing and assessment that we've done in the past. What, as I say, we've positively seen, though, is a very good response to doing that work online instead. And we've seen that positive response, not just from all of those within the community, but also our customers and stakeholders who have taken to what we're doing with a degree of understanding, um, but also a high degree of enthusiasm for making sure that they can still get the best out of what we provide with them. And I think that level of teamwork between all of us ends up producing something that provides us with great opportunities for the future. We are not going to go back to the level of on-site auditing and assessment we were at previously, but neither are we going to tip the balance so we are going completely to remote in the future. There is a balance there somewhere, a balance between on-site audit and assessment and remote audit and assessment. And I think what the last few months have shown us is that there are strengths in doing both of those. And what we now have the opportunity to do is maybe by taking those strengths of both on-site and remote, we can maybe get rid of some of the weaknesses that we had previously in just on-site. And we can end up doing a better job for all of those that need us to do that good job. So let's make sure that we take those ideas forward, that we maximize the benefits that we can gain out of a combination of on-site and remote. And that way we provide something better for everybody. But again, we've got to make sure that in that long term, we take everyone with us. We have to make sure that there is the widest possible acceptance of any new ways of doing things, of any alternatives in which we do things. We know there's still skeptics about using remote tools. We need to make sure that those people understand how it works properly and how we can iron out any problems that exist in the remote ideas so that people do get the best out of it. And then longer term, there's also the fact that technology has helped us in remote auditing, but actually digitalization and the use of digital tools will actually give us a much greater opportunity going forward. And I'll return to that shortly. Maybe one of the, the positives out of this awful pandemic is actually for the first time ever, we're starting to hear the language that we used far more widely used in the outside world. We hear on the news, people talking about trust and confidence, about how people need assurance in what's happening in the products that they're using. And I think for the first time ever, I've been in a situation where people have actually started to really understand what our jobs are all about. And to hear people in the media, on the news, various other outlets talking about the language that we use presents us with a massive opportunity. And that opportunity is to say to people, that's what we do. People have talked today about the complexity of what we do, how it can actually sometimes seem a little bit of a mystery. And let's face it, all of us that work in this industry have a tough time explaining to everybody what our jobs actually are. But when the outside world starts talking with the language that we use, maybe at long last, we actually have some people on our side in terms of being able to communicate because no longer are the strange words that we use like assurance and risk management and risk mitigation. No longer are those words just a mystery, but now they genuinely start to mean things to people as the pandemic has told people that they do need trust and confidence. They do need to be protected. They need assurance for their businesses, for the people in their country when it comes to the, the governments and for the individual as well. So I think there's a massive opportunity for us going forward 
to actually be able to explain to people, yes, that's what we do. We do that. We help you with all of those things. So what are going to be the key drivers taking us forward? Well, as I've just mentioned, we have the idea of risk management, but we've always had the idea of risk management. But I think it becomes ever more important now. And maybe in conformity assessment, maybe in our industry, maybe actually we're seeing a shift now away from exclusive assurance, but more towards risk management and risk management being tools being used by the accreditation community to assess certification bodies, by certification bodies to assess their customers and their clients. And I think if we can start using those ideas more, we can really start reaching out to people to say, we help you manage your risk, whatever your risk is. And as also has been explained today, we provide answers in so many different sectors, in so many different industries, in so many different ways that we will find a tool to help people out. But in the future, we also need to be very clear about what is going to be important, what sectors are going to thrive, what sectors are important, what sectors need conformity assessment. And at the same time, we need to make sure we're doing the right things for the right kind of business models that we now have in place. We can't be stuck in a system that started 20, 25 years ago and still presents the same answers. We need to make sure that our systems are flexible enough to be able to cope with how businesses work these days. And specifically, what we do see is year on year, we see the rise of the scheme. We see more and more sector schemes being developed by particular industries, by particular organisations to cope with the rising demands of new economies, of new products, of new services, of new desires, of new wants, of things that people actually need. And I think we need to make sure that we are a lot closer to that than we currently are. We need to make sure we understand these schemes, that we can help them out, that we can leap in there with rapid solutions to be able to help them um, provide the services they need to the up and coming industries. Now, part of this is obviously going to be digitalization. Now, digitalization presents both opportunity and threat, obviously. It will bring competition to us. It will bring competition to us we don't even know exists at the moment. There will be a whole manner of disruption out there that could affect the way that our industry goes. But I think we need to make sure we embrace digitalization. We need to make sure that it is a tool that works for us in delivering the core principles of what we're about, about trust, about assurance. So we need to make sure that we embrace the ideas of digitalization, both in terms of what we're doing with accreditation and in terms of certification as well. And that then leads into how important data and tools like AI are going to be that the way in which we assess people, the way in which we audit people will change as we use far more data. Stefan from IKEA talked about how he uses data to assess their products. So it's vital that we are part of that, that we're making sure that our systems can cope with the use of data. And that, ex that extends into new tools as well how we can use new monitoring tools, where we could actually end up having 24 seven data that we can then use to help businesses get better, that we can help organizations get better. We need to make sure that any of those kind of tools work for us in the robust way that we deliver accreditation and certification. So how do we prepare ourselves for this? Well, first off, we have to have a rock solid foundation. We have to have a strong system, a strong global system that builds those solid foundations. Because the world is changing at a crazy pace at the moment. We don't know what's around the corner. If some of the key fundamentals of what we do can be built on a very solid foundation, then we can be prepared for whatever is around the corner. And that's built on strong collaboration. 
and that strong collaboration works at a global level. We talk about globalization and, and international trade. Now that will work better if we're working better together. So we need to make sure that we continue to build the level of cooperation at a global level. And we have to be adaptable. You know, we quite often get thrown at us that we are an industry that doesn't adapt quick enough. We certainly have to adapt quicker than we are at the moment because the rise of new products, of new services, of new ways of doing things is changing at a, a bewildering pace at the moment. And we need to be able to help people out with whatever they are doing. So we have to be adaptable. We have to build a system that ensures that we have that adaptability in what we do. And one of the fundamentals to take us there is to make sure that we go forward with pride and with a justified confidence. And part of that justified confidence is the kind of things that Accredia talked about earlier today, where they talked about the data, the information that actually makes it very clear to people that this has fundamental benefits to their organizations, that we can provide people with the answers that they want, and it's going to make their organization better by using what we use. And it's very simple. We have to have ears to do that. We have to listen to what people need. Having spent many years in customer service, I used to always work on the uh, very clear premise that the best service you offer is when you remember you've got two ears and one mouth. If you listen in those kind of ratios, if you listen and talk in those ratios, you will be doing the right thing. We can make sure that we are taking the customer issues on board. We can make sure that we provide the solutions that boardrooms want, that governments want, not the solutions that we necessarily just want to dictate to people, but the methods that we use, the solutions that we have can be used to provide the, the answers that people need to their ever-changing needs. And by continuing to listen, by thinking about the future and understanding what customers need, we will make sure that we can do things better in the future. There you go. That's me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. There was a lot to reflect on in, in that, and we are glad that you will be back for the closing debate. So I see we will see you there. Thanks a lot. OK, perfect. Thank you very much. OK, let's go on. European Cooperation for Accreditation is the body responsible for European accreditation infrastructure. Andreas Dainos is the executive secretary of EA. He has held that position since 2014. Dr. Steinhaus has more than 20 years of experience from accreditation, not least, at least as the managing director for the German accreditation body, DAX. Dr. Steinhaus, we talk about the future for accreditation today. Which factor affects the accreditation, accreditation infrastructure the most? How will the regulators use accreditation in the future? Over to Frankfurt. So, Andreas. Yes, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon to Sweden and uh, good afternoon to, to everywhere where you are joining uh, this excellent uh, webinar. Um, yeah, I'm the last speaker. I yeah, we hear you, Andreas. Yeah, I, I have some some uh, feedbacks, so that's that's difficult. I guess uh, I have to look. So ca can you hear me? Yes, we hear you loud yeah, and clear, okay, Andreas. Fine. No, I, I had I have had some some. Uh, uh, echoes because I have also the uh, the streamline the live stream so oh. uh, so that now it works better so mm. I'm the last speaker and uh, it's it's always a challenge I guess we have already heard a lot of uh, accreditation uh, uh, market demands and also something about the future and um, 
I hope that I can can uh, provide you some more news, especially um, in regard to uh, uh, to the future. But first, give me also the chance, even if my colleague uh, Stefan from from Dax has already explained a lot about uh, EA. Give me the opportunity to to say some words to EA and and our activities before I come to my key uh, issue about uh, future of accreditation. So first, uh, yeah, EA is the uh, European Association of National Accreditation Bodies, and uh, the EA members are officially recognized by their national government to assess and verify conformity assessment bodies. Uh, the EU national accreditation bodies shall be a member uh, of EA by law. So that is, is, is I guess, important to, to mention. Uh, the recognized national accreditation bodies are listed in the Nando um, database. My colleague uh, Stefan has also mentioned uh, that uh, according to Regulation 765, EA is recognized uh, as the European accreditation uh, infrastructure. And uh, based on Regulation 765, we have signed uh, in 2018 the uh, third uh, framework partnership agreement with the European Commission, but uh, a similar one with, uh, with, e with EFTA. Um, there are also the guidelines for cooperation with the EU, EFTA, and the national authorities, which are published in the official journal of the EU. Um, and these guidelines set out, on one hand, the common understanding about accreditation, but on the other hand, also the expectations from the parties involved. That means from the European Commission, from EFTA, national authorities, and EA. Yeah, at the moment, uh, we have uh, in total 36 full members uh, that are national accreditation bodies coming from EU and EFTA countries, as well as identified countries to the EU. Uh, 34 of the full members are successfully peer evaluated for specific scopes. And uh, Stefan has already explained the value of peer evaluation and uh, the MLA signatory um, status. Furthermore, we have uh, 14 associate members from potential candidate countries to the EU, as well as uh, from countries which are covered in the EU neighborhood policy. Not all of them are yet peer evaluated by EA. Some of them are peer evaluated by other regions, but some of them are in the framework, in the peer evaluation framework of EA. What is also important to, to mention, if we're talking about market demands and uh, cooperation uh, and to be transparent, but also to, to listen, that is that we are cooperating with uh, the most important organizations relevant for the European quality infrastructure. At the moment, uh, we have around uh, uh, 40 so-called recognized stakeholders that are stakeholders where we have signed cooperation agreements uh, with. Stefan also mentioned that one task, and that is one of the key tasks of EA, is the peer evaluation of the national accreditation bodies. But there are some other important activities of, of EA. Uh, another one is the harmonization of accreditation throughout Europe. 
but uh, also the cooperation with and support of the European Commission and EFTA. And the latter issue is extremely important when we are talking about the future role and value of, of accreditation. That was some information about at least the present. And now I will try to give you some, yeah, a look uh, in the future, not not in a crystal ball, but a look in in the future, uh, at least regarding uh, accreditation and um, conformity assessment. And um, the demands of the market in in future that was already addressed by by Marcus. Uh, hence, uh, I will concentrate my presentation on the acceptance of accreditation by regulators. And uh, then I will provide some, some thoughts about new technologies and uh, its impact on conformity assessment and accreditation, even if uh, that was already tackled uh, by Marcus presentation um, as well. If we are looking to the future of accreditation, then yeah, we have to look first on the acceptance of accreditation uh, today. We all know the role of accreditation in regard to the EU product legislations, the so-called harmonized sector, where we have notified bodies and the CE marking. Um, and we know that uh, accreditation is a preferred means to demonstrate the competence of notified bodies. But accreditation is used by the regulators in many other sectors, like food and feed and agriculture or environment. Around seven years ago, the European regulator established the EU emission trading system, which includes the accreditation of verifiers. That was uh, an important step um, for not only for um, uh, the accreditation bodies, but of course for verifiers for all European citizens. But it was important uh, because that was also a linked to the introduction of a new standard. At that time, it was ISO IC 14065. But we know accreditation in some other regulated uh, sectors too. And one of those uh, sectors were mentioned this uh, afternoon already by, by Matt uh, Gantley from UCAS, uh, and that is, uh, for example, the forensic services. Now we have some new regulations in sectors which will be of specific importance, at least in, in, in terms of accreditation in the future. Um, the first example is the regulation on drones. This is not really a new type of accreditation because it is mainly about safety and the accreditation of, of notified bodies according specific conformity assessment uh, procedures. We know because uh, most many of them are already applied in regard to other notified bodies. But there are new regulations in partly new sectors and with different provisions on accreditation like the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation and the Cybersecurity Act. The GDPR is, is, is special, I, I have to say. Uh, the GDPR 
um, Article 43 on accreditation of certification bodies is deemed as lex specialis vis-a-vis -vis Regulation 765, where accreditation is defined as an activity performed by national accreditation bodies only. And uh, the GDPR, first time since uh, 765, has established a parallel way of demonstrating the competence of uh, conformity assessment um, bodies. Now we are happy that uh, most of the member states are using the option of uh, accreditation by the national accreditation bodies. Regarding the Cybersecurity Act, um, there will be soon the first uh, scheme called EU Cybersecurity Certification. And uh, this scheme will be published presumably next year as an implementing act. What concerns me here is that uh, for ICT products, processes, and services, that is the scope of the Cybersecurity Act, uh, with high assurance, with assurance level high, additional technical assessments by the authorities shall take place. And in some cases, and that is also new, peer review between accredited, authorized uh, conformity assessment bodies. In February this year, the Commission published its white paper on artificial intelligence. It includes reference to conformity assessment if it comes to demonstrate com um, compliance of AI products or AI applications with legal requirements. And uh, we are in contact with the European Commission in this regard and, and to, to, to support the European Commission in addressing conformity assessment and accreditation uh, according 765. That will be an important and challenging issue, of course, for, for citizens, for consumers, regulators, and of course, also for EA. Um, for EA, because it will not cover product safety requirements only, but also issues regarding fundamental rights. And both aspects shall presumably, and, and I hope so, covered by conformity assessment and accreditation. But it will be a challenge uh, also for the conformity assessment bodies, especially by small conformity assessment bodies, to deal with both aspects, not only with, with product safety. There are many conformity assessment bodies and notified bodies. There's a lot of, of experience, but also with those fundamental rights um, issues. But to summarize, we, we have currently more than 100 EU legislations which takes recourse to conformity assessment and, and accreditation. We have published uh, this year a directory it's a document uh, EA Info 5, where you can find all of these legislations in different sectors. And in many cases with some additional, I hope, uh, useful um, information. So if we are looking to more than 100 EU legislations and the future new sectors and applications, then we, we have to look and to address, uh, of course, uh, at least, at least uh, three items. And that is 
acceptance, that is what we are talking about, acceptance by, by the regulator. Also the obligation. And then of course, the challenges. First, acceptance. Yes, the European regulator trusts the European accreditation infrastructure in, in general. Uh, that is what, what uh, we, we have realized and what is demonstrated, in particular, of, co of course, with, uh, if we uh, can, can refer to more than 100 EU legislations uh, with reference to, to conformity assessment and um, accreditation. So, therefore, I think the European regulator will take recourse to accreditation in, in future increasingly. That is at least what, what, what I expect. And of course, if we, EA and its members, are con continue to, to doing a good job. But there are new parallel systems considered for existing and new sectors. And that is what we have to look at and to react on as, as soon as possible. So, Andreas, if you could try to summarize a bit quick now, because we are preparing for the uh, final yes. debate. So one minute there, more. Yes, sorry. And there's, of course, some obligations. Uh, the obligation is that we have to provide a competent, reliable and harmonized service for all the regulated sectors uh, that is for granted. But then the challenges. Uh, uh, yes, we have to establish the competence for every new sector. And that is especially a challenge for small national accreditation bodies. And, but that is our task, SEA, to support our members uh, in, in this respect. But also to ensure that the European regulator relies on accreditation for new sectors, including for sensitive and high-risk sectors, high-risk applications. And that, of course, that accreditation is applied according Regulation 765. So now my last few slides, and I need only two, two minutes more, that's about new technologies. And uh, here you have some examples on, on, on this slide. <clears throat> Yeah, some some new thoughts about new technologies due to the and that is what Marcus already addressed due to COVID nineteen pandemic. All of us were suddenly confronted with with new situation. Um, audits and assessments couldn't take place as usual, but our members had to manage uh, the situation in order and to ensure that regulators, consumers, and markets have still trust on on accreditation. And therefore, they have really very fast introduced remote assessment, remote witnessing, remote file reviews, and other means to ensure that the assessment of, of CAPS can, can go on in a robust and a reliable um, manner. But we have also some new technologies and um, some examples, blockchain, smart sensors, smart glasses. And if you look to some of them, some may argue that, for instance, with blockchain, is there still conformity assessment needed in future? And with that accreditation, I would say yes. Somebody has to control and the architecture of, of blockchain. But we have to be prepared for, for those new technologies. Um, and, and there are some questions uh, how to, to assess those technologies with which procedures and techniques do we need as accreditors to look at those conformity assessment bodies using those new technologies. We have to be prepared and uh, I mentioned that uh, EA will support uh, its members but also the regulator when it comes to uh, conformity assessment and accreditation in, in light of digitalization. And the first step will be another conference but this time perf uh, uh, performed by EA. It's our conference on cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and uh, digitalization on the 26th of November. And I hope I can see you there um, again. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Andreas, for your important contribution. Now we will just take a short break to rearrange for the uh, closing debate. We will be back as soon as we can, let's say in about five minutes. Thank you all. Welcome to our closing debate. We have Andreas Steinhaus, Executive Secretary at EEA, Marcus Long, CEO at IIOC, Matt Gantley, Chief Executive at UCAS, Ulf Amarström, Director General at SWEDAC, and Christina Haldman, Head of the Accreditation Department and Deputy Director General at SWEDAC in our panel. Welcome. And we will start by uh, showing the results from the Menti poll. We have now processed them and thank you everyone for your contribution. We will start with the first question, which was, in your opinion, what are the challenges for, accredit for accreditation to be relevant in the future? And the results show, as you can see here on the chart, that 10% of you finds competition from other forms of quality assurance. That is the main challenge. 16% finds to apply the accreditation system across borders between countries and regions. 47% to adapt the accreditation system to the market needs. And 25% to implement the use of artificial intelligence and the possibilities that the increasing digitalization enables. Digitalization, yes. And 2% on other options. So Ulf, what's your comment on this result? Well, to me, that is a happy result if one can uh, label it as that. I think this webinar was all about listening and understanding better the uh, different opinion and the different perspectives, both from markets and from, uh, from the accreditation bodies. So uh, that the big result is adapting, I think, is very much in line with this. And, and obviously, we talked a lot about mm -hmm. digitalization and so on. So it seems like uh, we and the audience is uh, in line with our thinking. Matt, uh, do you have any comment uh, to this uh, result from the Manti poll? Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with Ulf. I think um, a, another way of looking at those results instead of it's a challenge is they are the opportunities. And Marcus and uh, Andreas also have talked that through is you know, we face a very different world uh, going forward. Uh, COVID-19 has been a catalyst in driving forward uh, the adoption of digitization, and we've seen that through the remote assessments. We've got to take that forward as an opportunity with blended assessments, uh, the Internet of Things, cybersecurity, they're all, you know, huge opportunities for us to develop new products. And from an operational perspective as well, embodying using digitization to improve our assessment reports, the way we interact with customers, the way we monitor information from our customers, the way in which we adopt a risk-based approach. I would certainly agree with all of that. And, and the new products and services, um, adapting to the way that the market is changing is, absolutely. I see those as, as opportunities just as much as a, a challenge to deliver. Thank you, Matt, for your comments. Christina, what's your take on this uh, result? No, for me, it's not a surprise either, and it's really in line what we have already listened to. Uh, development is moving very, very rapidly in society. Product life cycles get shorter and shorter. So I think that the tempo in the accreditation process is critical for the future. Uh, one approach could be to increase the use of flexible accreditation, for instance, but we had already mentioned that uh, we have a challenge to explain accreditation and uh, bringing in flexible scope May, doesn't make it easier, but I think it's important. Thank you, Christina. Marcus, uh, do you have any comments from uh, the CAB Association side from this? Yeah, I, I, I love the word that's just been used by Christina there of tempo. I think that's a, a really key one that we need to take out of this. I think over the last few months, uh, the, the tempo at which we've worked and which we've made decisions has increased immeasurably. I've, I've never known the level of activity um, from our community that uh, uh, I've witnessed over the last six months, six, seven months. And I think that's really encouraging. But I think we must take these things that we're hearing here 
and um, address it with gusto, with tempo, to make sure that we really do take these things forward, that we don't just nod at them again and say, yes, yeah, yeah, that all makes sense. Um, we need to do things on there. And I think what we find from those different um, ideas that the survey has shown us is that some of them give us requirements, but some also talk about the enablers, about how we can go forward and do these things. So I think we need to make sure that we're embracing all of these things in something that is done both robustly, but with it, with the speed that we have done things in the last few months. Uh, and I think if we can we, if we can continue with that robustness and with that speed, we can do great things that we can be proud of. Thank you, Marcus. Any final uh, comments, conclusion from your side, Andreas, on this uh, answer on the first Manti poll? No, in in general, I I, I agree with with my uh, with my colleagues, but I'm a little bit surprised about the low number of votes for in regard to the competition of other forms of quality assurance and attestation because uh, some of them are closely linked to even to new technologies i totally agree that uh, to adapt to market needs is is one key challenge for the future and especially digitalization but uh, if we are looking to digitalization we have some um uh, systems already in place which are not i will not say in compliance with 765 they are not using at least so far accreditation they have their own systems but uh, here we have to to demonstrate that uh, the professionals for uh, assessing conformity assessment bodies uh, are the national accreditation bodies that is accreditation and i'm totally uh, con convinced about that. So I'm a little bit surprised, but in general, I can can totally agree with my uh, with my colleagues. Thank you, Andreas. Anna, the next Manti. Yes, exactly. Our second question was: In your opinion, by 2030, will the demands for accreditation in present accreditation areas increase, decrease, or be unchanged? And as you can see in the chart. 45% thinks it will increase with up to 50%, 9% believes in a decrease, and 47% believes in a steady state. And we will actually move to our third question, as we are a little bit short of time here, so we'll present the results from our third question. And that was, in your opinion, where do you see a possibility for accreditation to develop and increase its growth within the next 10 years. And as you see from the chart, 4% believes this is in present areas, 31% in regulated areas, 4% believes in private sectors, and 60% believes in sectors that are not using accreditation today. So these were the results from the Menti poll, and thank you again for uh, contributing to that, everyone in the audience. Uh, if we now broaden the perspective and, and leave the poll aside for a, a moment, uh, and Ulf, uh, if you look at the bigger picture, where do you find accreditation and the value of accreditation stands today? Which is Svedak's view on this? Well, thank you. I've been uh, listening all afternoon and uh, there's really a lot to learn from uh, listening to all the different perspectives. Uh, I believe that there is a pretty harmonized view in many ways on, on these issues that uh, accreditation is fundamentally about trust and we need to both protect that trust uh, and also to make sure that we are agile in uh, our continuous development. Uh, we, we all agree, and I think that very much also from a Swedish perspective, that we have a huge role in uh, educating, informing, making known uh, what we stand for. And it will be especially or increasingly challenging in a time with uh, fast changes. And um, I agree to what I think also everyone has um, in a way said, that the pandemic is changing us forever. There will be a new balance in on-site and remote assessments. Uh, it will affect peer reviews and um, 
uh, this is a key role to reform. And I think also not least uh, interesting, which I will talk with my ministry about as quickly as possible, is Acredia's view on using accreditation within the EU recovery fund. I think that was a very interesting idea. Uh, well, when it comes to um, my own thoughts, in addition to this, I think that the use of data is a very key thing where we are within Swedak uh, starting to uh, work on using the, the data we have historically and uh, are collecting all the time uh, so that it can be more helpful to us that we learn from it. And that's, of course, risk management is an obvious part. Um, I also think that uh, we need more cooperation between the accreditation bodies. I think that we are in a way, inventing the wheel ourselves, everyone, uh, in an unnecessary fashion. We have mostly, as far as I know anyway, and we definitely have it, our own IT systems, and we have our own training and so on, on the same standards. And there I think we could, uh, we could cooperate more to the benefit of, uh, of the system and uh, customers. I agree, of course, with uh, Christina on uh, the need to keep tempo. Uh, I think we need more involvement by the uh, senior management in, in a continuous way. We now pretty much focus on, on uh, general assemblies and so on, but I think we collectively need to be, be more continuously um, involved. And the, in the European case, of course, the, um, the dialogue with the Commission is critical on the future role and... Um, and uh, acting of the, or working of the of the system. Uh, so I think very encouraged that uh, we seem to have pretty harmonized opinions. It's all about doing it. And I think a little bit maybe Marcus summarized it in that we need to protect and improve. I think that could be the two words maybe summarizing our way forward as well. Protect and improve. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ulf. Uh, Matt Gantley, how well does this reflect Yuka's view on what has been discussed about the future today? Yeah, um, I think we're looking at the data itself. I think um, maybe the my, my reflection would be that the, the, the positive upside in terms of growth of, of up to 50% growth, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily see that as um, as as much as where it's going to be. I think it's probably uh, too positive. I think uh, generally the market is quite mature, and so therefore I, I think uh, you know up to 10% growth overall is is probably what we would expect. Um, what I would also suggest is that uh, the, the balance between what is regulated uh, or the regulatory driver of 31% and the non-accredited is, is probably about right. I think um, Andreas uh, in his presentation said there's around about just over 100. Um, uh, schemes within uh, Europe that are connected to uh, original European legislation and that just shows the, the importance of the connection between the, the work of the European Union and uh, accreditation. Um, but I think the, the, the overall uh, voluntary non uh, market is actually a, a major part of growth in the future. Um, reflecting on all the other things that uh, we've we've seen and we've heard uh, over the last uh, the day, I think I very much uh, reflect mirror what um, Ulf has said. Our own priorities at UCAS as you know, one of the largest uh, accreditation bodies in Europe is is very much the same as as you know uh, Marcus has described and Andreas has described and Ulf has described. Is that you know our, one of our first priorities is ensuring we have strong international collaboration at a European level and an international level. Um, quality is, is absolutely critical to delivering our services and that, that's why I put customer service right at the very front of, of the way that we deliver that. Um, the way in which we explain accreditation, I think Ulf is correct again in there, in, terms, in order to deliver growth uh, in regulated and unregulated areas, we need to communicate much better the, the value of accreditation and use data like uh, Accredia have presented us with, as with today to open up minds to the opportunity and the flexibility of accreditation into new and emerging areas. 
We also need to use that technology uh, ourselves. Um, and you know, UCAS, we're investing very much in our ERP system, our portal, our assessment reporting, as well as the way in which we interact with our customers and using data, much more ongoing evaluation of um, of their performance in order in order to drive a, a risk-based uh, approach. Um, but underlying all of that, um, Marcus did pick up on many of these points here, is that you know we need a culture, not just at UCAS, but across uh, accreditation that is constructive, collaborative, uh, outward looking, and very much consistent in the way that it works. I think you know there's many structural things that we need to do, uh, lots of hard work and engagement, but we need to also think about the, uh, the cultural side as well. Thank you, Matt. Great, thank you. And um, I turn to Christina now. From your standpoint, what what do you what's your reflection on all this? Yeah, we have discussed and heard uh, reflections about uh, opportunities and also challenges. And some of the challenges uh, that I do see and which are correlated to each other are availability of competence and the cost for accreditation. There is a positive trend that accreditation is used to ensure reliability and trust in a wide range of areas. Uh, that is a very positive signal uh, that there is confidence in the accreditation system. Uh, it is, however, difficult to anticipate the market need in some cases, as Matt has uh, told us about. And the cost per accreditation can become very high if there are only a few actors interested. And in small, very niche areas, uh, it also becomes difficult to ensure availability of core competence. Uh, and how is the availability of niche technical competence uh, in the future? I do not think it will be easier. Uh, there is a trend uh, with uh, the gig economy that might work in our favor, that working on a global market will be more common. The trend could, however, was result that more people are changing jobs more quickly and that the availability of experts with long experience will, uh, in a particular field, it will become even rare. And if competence is limited in availability, that usually means that it drives costs. Uh, and it's important, I think, to prevent uh, that the system in, in general, in, in the opinion of legislators and also on market, get the re reputation of being too costly. So I think that we need together, as we have done today, share experience and learn from each other, to say no to some areas and also to focus together on promote the role of technical experts to increase the popularity of working with the accreditation bodies. Uh, and today many of us are, uh, due to the pandemic, uh, adapting our way of working as we have already discussed. And uh, the technology are in many cases very good, but in some cases not efficient. But to continue to develop it together I think is very important. Thank you, Christina. Over to Marcus Long. How does this reflect uh, IOC's view on the, the future? I think there are a couple of things from what people have talked about today. I think, first of all, the demand as much as anything is up to us. Uh, if we're bold and if we can do the right things, uh, then we can grow as much as we want. But actually, I think there's a couple of key things we need in place to do that. I think the word cooperation is a massively important word here. Um, and sometimes we do spend too much time looking at the operational issues and not actually thinking about the future and strategy. And maybe one of the things that we do need to do is actually to put together some kind of foresight group within the conformity assessment community to actually bring together um, the, the great and the good and the wise not just from our industry, but from outside our industry to actually say what is going to be important in the future. And we do need to prioritise them. We do. We can't back every single horse. We can't we can't go with everything that everybody wants us to do. So let's maybe try and bring those people together and start thinking about what we should be doing. And as has been said, we have limited resources in this industry and there's an awful lot of repetition. 
there's still repetition. We have a global system. We have a fabulous global system. Let's make sure we use that global system and not waste our limited resources, efforts and energy by all doing things individually, where actually we can bring people together uh, and produce a much better um, and a more coordinated approach that will deliver more things for more people in the future. And we always say it, and we've said it numerous times today, communication and education is still such a huge part of that. Um, and, I, and I fundamentally believe that we still play too much lip service to that. We talk about always wanting it, but we never really put our money where our mouth is and actually say, let's let's really come out with some good arguments. Let's really come out with some good information to help people. So I think the future is in our hands. I think we, we can do great things. We can go forward very positively, um, but I think we do need to work better together to do that. And the more we can do that, the more we can achieve for ourselves, but most importantly, for our customers and our stakeholders. Thank you, Marcus. And Andreas Steinhorst, what is your view on all this? I can finally only agree with it was uh, the previous speaker has already said, but perhaps uh, let me say, yes, I, I think we, 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 I would not say we have to protect and to improve. I would say that uh, we have to continue with our good job in the existing uh, sectors. And from my point of view, especially in the regulated uh, sector, here we have already demonstrated that accreditation by the national accreditation body is the best tool to demonstrate competence of conformity assessment bodies. But on the other hand, of course, we have also to look to the to the new sectors with the new challenges. And, and one example was already mentioned, the uh, um, artificial uh, intelligence uh, uh, applications, uh, where we need uh, new competencies, new expertise, and uh, that is uh, where I totally agree with my, my colleagues, where we have to cooperate. So it will be much easier to, to be prepared if we do it together instead of uh, uh, everybody alone. So EA, we will take it on board and we will take it uh, seriously. It was also mentioned by Christina that we have those small areas even these days where some uh, accreditation bodies have only one or two accredited conformity assessment bodies. And, and here it would be perhaps more efficient uh, to, to, to cooperate uh, uh, with NEA, with other national accreditation bodies, uh, it could be more efficient uh, uh, for for everybody involved. So that is also where where we have to to look at, especially uh, in regard to to uh, to to future sectors. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Andreas. We are getting closer to the end here, so we just have a final uh, closing question. So after listening today, what have you found most interesting, and how will you take take action? In a few words, I will hear from you. I would like to hear from you. Matt, would you like to start? Gosh, yeah, I, I think uh, Peter might have said it already. Uh, it's been a very useful uh, uh, event for us. It's uh, just, I think, if, if anything, it's just reaffirmed the, the importance of collaboration, as everyone said, and for, especially in Europe, for accreditation bodies to work together to ensure that we deliver the very highest level of uh, accreditation for regulators right across the uh, European continent and also an industry uh, and ensuring that we provide a, an excellent service for our conformity assessment bodies. So I think for me, it's uh, just reaffirmed the importance of working closely together. Uh, both UCAS and SWEDAC have a very strong relationship. And for me, that's uh, something we all, we're very much committed to working on in the, in the future. Thank you very much, Matt Gantley from UCAS. I will ask Marcus Long from IIOC the same question. What is your main takeaway from, uh, from this afternoon and how will you take action moving forward, please? Um, I think the thing that I've learned is that it's very encouraging that we know the answers. We know an awful lot of the answers and what we must do we don't know all the answers, but we know where to go and get those answers. So I think that's the key thing that I've taken out of this is that there's a, a great awareness of what we need to do. Um, what's the action out of that? 
we've got to do it. It really is that simple. We've got to we've got to do what we've heard about today and what we've all talked about. Let's stop talking about it and let's make sure we get out there and do it. Great, thanks. Thank you, Marcus. I put the same question to Andrea Steinhaus. What have you found most interesting and how will you take action tomorrow? <laughs> Uh, I found everything very interesting. So thank you for the uh, for the webinar. But uh, for me, it 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 uh, is really key. It's a co collaboration b between uh, all the parties invo uh, involved. Not only between the national accreditation bodies, also with with uh, uh, the conformity assessment bodies, with the uh, industry, with the regulators. Uh, and to, to listen what um, about their needs, especially in regard to to uh, uh, future um, developments. So um, we will take that on board, of course, in uh, our own uh, EA work, in our EA strategy. Some of those uh, issues are, are already uh, covered in the EA strategy 2025 but we will review what is uh, still missing and what we have to cover uh, in the next strategy, perhaps in the strategy 2030. Great, thank you so much, Andreas Steinhorst from EA. I will now turn to Kristina Hallman from Sverak and ask you the same question. What is your main takeaway and how will you take action tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, uh, dialogue and sharing experience is vital for development. That is very obvious. And for me, to hearing the strength of getting figures on the facts, for instance, Stefan's and also the Acredia lecture, is very inspiring. You see in communication, you get the strength. Right? So continue with uh, that kind of dialogue is what I'm going to do. Yes, great. Thank you. Thank you. Some final remarks from you, Ulf. Most interesting and how you will take action. Well, I think the speed and the scope of developments which we need to ensure that we uh, develop for, I think, is, uh, is my main takeaway. Cooperation, I will do my very best to, uh, to increase that and, and try to make sure that we uh, develop together with the, with the other NABs. But also uh, the feeling of the very fundamental role of assurance and giving stability to society that we also need to try to protect through the changes. Great. So thank you all speakers. Thank you everyone in the room for great presentations. Um, and thank you everyone listening in from links all around the world. Thank you for your contribution. We have investigated many aspects of the value of accreditation. We hope we have given you all some food for thought. Now let's take on the future. Thank you all.